Are we live? Are we alive? Uh, we, 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 we should be, yeah. I've just, I've just uh, sent Ben a message to... Um, okay, cause I'll do in, we'll do intros so uh, yeah. people on screen we'll, then we'll know start, who we are. We'll start it. We'll start it. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, so, welcome to this meeting of the Tra West Shorts Transport Committee. My name is Susan Hinchcliffe. I'm the chair of the committee and leader of Bradford Council. I just want to go around the room and just in, everybody introduce themselves, because some people at home watching possibly, um, who might want to know who we are. So, um, moving on to Manisha. Afternoon, everyone. Manisha Kaushik from Kirklees. I'm a deputy on the transport. Good afternoon, Councillor Peter Carlyle. I'm a councillor in Leeds, but I'm a deputy chair of the transport committee at West Yorkshire. Good afternoon, Councillor Taj Salam, Bradford Council. Good afternoon, Councillor Isaac Wilson, Leeds Council. Yeah, uh, Kevin Swift representing Wakefield. Good afternoon, Councillor Ellen Thompson from Leeds. Hi everyone, Councillor Matthew McLaughlin from uh, Kirklees. Good afternoon, Councillor Melanie Jones, Wakefield Council. Councillor Hassan Khan, Bradford Council. Uh, Councillor Peter Clark, Bradford Council. Councillor Neil Buckley, Old Woodley Ward in Leeds. Martin Bolt, Murfield Ward, Kirklees Council. Uh, Andy Dagon, <laughs> City of York Council. Good afternoon, Colin Hutchinson, Councillor from Calderdale. Uh, let's move to um, Policy and um, Development Director. Eric Haskins, Head of Transport Implementation for Planning Authority. Good afternoon, I'm Kevin Murray, I'm the Interim Director for Mass Transit and the Command Authority. Hello, I'm Helen Ellerton, Interim Head of Transport Policy. I'm Dave Pearson, Director of Transport Property Services at the Combined Authority. And Ian? Uh, uh, Ian Park, Governance Services Officer. Lovely, I think we've got AFAC, what? I am. It's okay. Hey, it's okay, welcome. <laughs> Uh, um, from Kirklees, representing Kirklees Council. So as you will see, we've got um, councillors from all across West Yorkshire who are uh, allocated by their uh, local authorities to come and make decisions jointly about West Yorkshire transport. Transport is something that crosses boundaries, of course, so it's good to do those decisions together in West Yorkshire. So a number of things to get through on the, on the agenda today. So first of all, let's start with apologies for absence. Um, oh, it's okay. Um, so I've had apologies from Amir Hussein, Councillor Caffrey, Councillor Cunningham, Councillor Firth, Councillor Hayden, Councillor Rothshaw, and Councillor Scullion. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, declarations of disclosable, disclosable pecuniary interests. That is quite hard to say, isn't it, really? Anybody got any interests to declare on the agenda? Well, I'm not really sure, Chair, but I mean, uh, I, I did declare them in my declaration of interest, but just so I, I work in the uh, bus industry. Thank you. We all have our register of interest up to date, but that's good of you to double double mention that. Uh, Councillor Thompson? Likewise, also on the register of interest, um, husband who is an employee of Atkins. Lovely. Uh, in that case, do declare if there's anything that occurs to you through the meeting. Um, exempt information. I'm not sure I just saw anything about exclusions no, of the no, public today. No, that's fine. Uh, minutes of the meeting of the Transport Committee held on the 1st of July 2022. Those have been circulated within these papers. So anybody got any amendments or comments that they need to make on those? No? In that case, can we see those pass the correct record? All those in favour, please show. Thank you, that is carried. Um, so the first um, item on the agenda proper, I suppose, is uh, mini budgets, accelerated schemes. Now, obviously, this is a fast-moving day. Uh, and um, uh, this time last week, obviously, we had a mini budget that everybody's sticking to. Now it's less sure. Uh, obviously, I'm not. I'm not sure if there is a chance of the exchequer is at the moment. Just looking to conservative colleagues. Are you aware of anybody? Have we got anybody? Well, <laughs> ah, thank you very much, Jeremy Hunt. Obviously, is going to be the next chance of the exchequer. Um, so. 
Obviously, when uh, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, comes with a mini budget, we look immediately at what's going to happen in West Yorkshire and what we can make sure we can push ahead with. Because we're all about delivery, of course, in West Yorkshire, trying to get the best transport for people. Uh, and in the mini budget, uh, there were some schemes that were mentioned um, in the list of was it, was it 100, 150 schemes nationally that they're going to accelerate to push economic growth. So I thought it would be a good idea for us to have a look at the ones that they mentioned in West Yorkshire and just ask officers where about those are, because obviously that's um, quite important that we uh, show how we can contribute to economic growth uh, nationally, albeit we want clean growth here, don't we? That's actually quite important for us and we see quite a lot of uh, advanced um, economic opportunity by pushing that agenda. So this paper, uh, goes through each of those schemes uh, and just uh, tells us where they are at. And I don't know who's going to talk to this. Dave Haskins, yeah, yeah. you want to introduce this paper? I'll, I'll introduce it in as, as much as you've, you've said some of the bones of what, what the paper's about. You know, not nine schemes highlighted in West Yorkshire out of 150. Some of them are, dare I say, more strategic where we're not the promoters of the scheme and some of the ones where, where we are responsible. These are, it should be noted, of course, that most of the schemes we deliver in West Yorkshire have been devolved uh, by the government, so it's our responsibility to deliver them. Some of these schemes are ones where the government has an interest in, they're doing some other direct funding outside our devolved funding sources, and that's why they're interested in these. It's fair to say they set up this acceleration unit, um, and about a week or so ago they said they wanted to have a series of meetings with us to talk about how we accelerate these projects on the back of the mini-budget. Uh, pleasing in some ways, we've already have already had two meetings with the unit to talk about talk about what's in this report, and I think probably got another one early next week. So there's there's a lot of uh, work going on here quite quickly around them. I don't I don't plan to talk through every single one of these in here, but but actually DFT have, have said to us that there's a number of areas of focus that they're looking at, and while this list of nine, I think you've rightly pointed out, we're about sort of rapid delivery. This this list of nine is important to DFT. The list of the other 300 plus transport projects we've got. A number of the same principles should be applying. So they're looking at areas of focus around, um, and some of this has happened since we've written the report, making sure we've got certainty of funding and streamlining of funding, which I think is really important to us. An early agreement on future CRSDS, the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement, to engage in them early on that. Um, about capability and capacity, making sure we've got more resources uh, and support to deliver the projects locally. You know, we have some, some pressures uh, in some areas in terms of uh, delivery resource. Uh, where we can have more local powers uh, to make local decisions around projects, which is clearly welcomed. More flexibility of funding, uh, proportionate approaches to business case development, which I think we do do already, but I think they're looking for more flexibility in some areas. And for instance, in the paper, we talk about the two projects, Tong Street and Dawson's Corner. We're actually looking to see if we can get those decisions made locally as opposed to made by the Department for Transport following the next stage. We've been successful with other projects in doing that over time, as long as they're under a certain threshold. Um, central government approvals, I think you'll see as you look through the paper, a number of the areas where we highlight acceleration potential on projects is actually where there are holdups in central government in approvals. Uh, against that, however, we have uh, some examples such as uh, the trans route upgrade, where the Transport Works Act order, uh, which is a, a full legal process you need to go through to get the approvals, that was accelerated uh, with support from government. So we, ha we have seen some progress in these areas already. And the final one they wanted to focus on is things like uh, coordination uh, with utilities and agencies as well. And I think we do a lot of good work around that already. So I think while the area of focus of acceleration is really key from government, I think we're really well placed to start with in the work we've been doing over the last number of years with our portfolio. Um, like I said, I don't plan to go through every single one in this report, but maybe you want to pick up on any particular projects and we can, we can answer questions. Thank you very much for that, Dave. I mean, obviously, the, the obvious one from a Bradford point of view to pick up on is in Northern Powerhouse Rail and um, the Prime Minister saying that Bradford should be a stop on Northern Powerhouse Rail. So, obviously, I'm particularly pleased to see that one in the list um, and something that I know we, we continue to do work on in Bradford and West Yorkshire in the meantime because we know it's a good proposition and we know it brings clean growth uh, to Bradford and, indeed, to West Yorkshire and the north. Uh, so, it, it's good to see that. Um, there are others in here as well, like lead, lead station enhancement, which I believe the work has already started on lead station, hasn't it? Um, I suppose what I'm looking for in here really is where government is a barrier or 
are there some quick wins in here that they can work with us on to make sure we can unlock these projects and accelerate them further? I suppose that's what we're looking for here. But other people may have come, um, questions in their own areas. Councillor Swift. Well, I don't think that's possible because that money's already signed off and been delivered on the ground. So uh, I would like to think, obviously, TRU, for me, is already committed to, and they should never renege on that because that is a really important piece of infrastructure for the North. And indeed, is on this list, is it, as well, transparent upgrade. Yeah. Um, so you're right to alert us to that. I think the, the main problem, I think, is probably inflation. That £96 billion won't go as far as it did when it was first announced a year ago. Uh, I think that, that is probably going to be a greatest concern. Uh, Councillor Buckley. Thank you, Chair. And uh, it was a technical question, really, on White Rose Station. Um, this, the papers confirm here, is on site. And um, we've always referred to it as White Rose Station. But actually, when, when you look at the area, you've got the White Rose Retail Complex which most people think of as White Rose, and this is what they identify with this proposed station. And then at the bottom, um, further down, you've got the um, commercial office um, property uh, who have contributed, my understanding is they've contributed to the scheme. And um, my understanding now is that the station will actually be nearer to the office complex than the retail park. Now, be that as it may, you mentioned quick wins a few minutes ago. I just wanted confirmation that there's some provision to get people on foot from the station to the retail park. Because the last thing we want to do is to have a great shiny station where people are cut off from the retail park. Um, so some kind of, uh, in the new jargon, you know, active travel, walking and cycling, it must be provided for, surely. Okay, so um, and we'll take those two questions first then. So obviously, I don't suppose you can give any government uh, commitments, uh, uh, the full 96 billion, etc. Uh, but just some uh, conversation about uh, the, the work that's been going on about Transpanine upgrade, and then also uh, around the White Rose question. I can, I can certainly answer the White, the white Rose question. Um, as you say, it's on, it's on site at the moment. Um, there is provision in the budget and plans within the budget uh, to do walking cycle routes to the station. I think you're right, it's closer to the office park than the actual um, shopping centre. And the reasons for that are around sort of engineering feasibility and where the best location for a station would fit. The, the, at the moment, if you're close to where the station is, the, walk, the walking routes aren't, aren't great. Uh, they're not well lit, they're not well surfaced. So I think what we're doing is putting in be better facilities there, not just from the shopping centre, but also from other local communities to get to the to get to the station. So that's that's a key part of our proposals at the moment. So it's a good thought, and uh, but the thought of it already. So thank you, Councillor Buckley. Um, Councillor, I think Councillor Salam and then Councillor Bolt. Uh, uh, Dave, I'm, I'm I'm glad that you know I mean it, it, these um, the uh, A650 and and, and the Dorset Corner uh, uh, and Stanningley Bypass are in the in the paper and. And those are the two schemes that are up for acceleration because we've spent a lot of money on the superhighway from Bradford to Leeds, but Dorset's Corner, it, I mean, especially going back from Leeds, Dorset's Corner is it's like a cut-off point, you know, where you've got to negotiate through all the traffic and, and traffic lights and everything else because there's nothing clearer for, for the cycling or, or the walking, uh, and you've got to be really careful. And then Tong Street, I think, is, is similar. That the, and... But on Tong Street, my worry is that, you know, sometimes these cycle lanes are actually blocked by parked cars and, and people are actually either forced to go onto the pavement, which they have to then negotiate through pedestrians, or they're forced to go onto the road. So local knowledge is also 
you know, vital in that when we are actually designing those. And Councillor Bolt. Okay, thanks. Just picking up on Taj's point, it's now, or unless they've changed it in the last five minutes, it should be part of all the planning process for developing major schemes under what was called gear change, the document that was released at the time, that schemes are developed by people for cycling infrastructure who've actually cycled them. So Taja's point about local knowledge uh, is backed up by government directive, and I hope that's something that we're seeing through all our major schemes, is that um, officers who are developing these, somebody has cycled them. Because um, that comes on to another one that's in here, Thorpe Park, um, and to some degree the uh, East Leeds Orbital Road. I was cycling um, up towards Thorpe Arch and Thorner and found that Elaw um, has cut off some of the traditional routes that cyclists have used. So going from Barrick and Scholes across the Thorner, the A64 now is cut off at the bottom of Thorner Lane. Um, cyclists therefore have had to find an alternative route through which is going through a cemetery. Um, rather, because you, you wouldn't go around the, the main road around the A64 Elaw. So the, the active travel links for Elaw, I think, need looking at. And the Thorpe Park Station, when I was looking at the potential links from ELR and Thorpe Park, it seems that the segregated cycleway comes all the way down on the new project, and then there's very little in the way of any infrastructure coming through Thorpe Park, Colton Moor, and those big employment areas, and particularly getting people from the south, from Rothwell, Wakefield, Kirklees, or wherever you may work, up to those employment generators. And the same going through Wakefield as the, uh, the Amazon and the uh, cold distribution place at Wakefield, but very little in the way of active travel to get people, again, from Rothwell to those. So we, as part of our active travel, we should be looking at those links. TRU, when we've discussed with Network Rail about the work that they're doing on Transparent and Android Upgrade, they seem to be very limited in what they're delivering. They'll do the rail works, but using uh, Ravensthorpe Railway Station as an example, very minimal passenger facilities, car parking, etc. Yet we've, we've talked about growth, and adjacent to Ravensthorpe Railway Station is the Dewsbury Riverside project, 5,000 houses. If we don't plan for growth, Network Rail turn around and say it's not in our remit to do X, Y, Z. It's the, either Wicker or the local authorities. Well, let's have some joined up thinking while they're planning it. And if we need to be reprofiling local budgets, our budgets, to make sure that we have uh, parking facilities, to make sure that there is these adequate passenger facilities on the stations for people, that they're not left until later, because once Network Rail have moved off site, the chance of getting anything back on is very minimal. So, as we are, we're all looking for growth, and the potential that Jews Riverside is one of the, uh, in fact, the leader mentioned it at Kirk Lees, it's an investment zone. So we need to make sure that that's all linked up. You know, we used to talk about integrated transport. Let's hope we can do it with these. So does someone want to come back on the um, TRU and what we're doing on TRU? Whether that's Dave or Helen or... Um, so thank you. So just on, on TRU, so obviously we've been through the transport works section for up to Huddersfield, reduced the Huddersfield area, and Network Rail are um, in the process of starting works to deliver that. And there was a session a couple of weeks ago with members on TIE session on that around to set out that programme from Network Rail in a bit more detail. Um, we're having conversations with Network Rail around kind of TIE from the, to the east of Leeds and to the wide in the wider picture um, for which that um, <coughs> development, if you like, is um, to be a bit more forthcoming. There is a programme board. There is a programme board, yes. And if I to just yeah. add, add to what Helen said, um, in terms of... Give Councillor Bolt, a little bit of reassurance. Um, as part of the transparent route upgrade for the Huddersfield to, to, to Dewsbury section, mm. um, a, 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 um, it's a quarterly meeting between the Director of Development of Kirklees, Leeds, ourselves, and the Senior Director at Network Rail to, um, to pick up the sort of points that Councillor Bolt's making around interfaces with other developments, interfaces with other things the councils are doing. So there is a little bit of in the TIU governance to try and pick that up, even though 
as to how it's uncomfortable. So it's kind of, there, there's a hard stop as to how much the railway is actually doing and what happens beyond it. But um, just to be assured that uh, those conversations are happening. So to go back on to um, Councillor... I'll go back. There's, there's sort of commonality in the points in some way of Councillor Slam, Councillor Bolt around cycle lanes and, you know, cycle users. I mean, it's fair to say... We're engaging very closely with Active Travel England now, and Active Travel England have a, a sort of checklist that they've developed and that we are going to be working with them to make sure that as schemes are developed going forward, we are meeting the requirements early on and we don't get to a point in the project where we realise something's been really overlooked. And I think working and engaging with, with cycle users is really key to that. On Thorpe Park, I think we're going to be looking at a similar approach to what we've used on White Rose and looking at accessibility requirements from a range of, a range of locations nearby Although clearly it's, there's only so far the project can can go in terms of what it's trying to what it's trying to reach, the e-law issue I'll, I'll take that away and have a discussion around that to understand what might what what the issue might be there as well. I'm happy to happy to pick up on that, but I think that's just cut out, is it? Yeah. <laughs> dipping in, dipping in now. Uh, to get the projects resolved early on rather than get to the end of the project and realise there isn't there is an issue. That's what we're about. Lovely, thank you very much. And I think just going back to Tong Street and Dawson's Corner, obviously it was a few years since those schemes were put into the mix, wasn't it, for government? So um any any finances there, the government may need to review those, otherwise they won't be as accelerated as they'd like them to be. So I think in the recommendations, we're talking about uh, the Transport Committee and uh, myself writing to Secretary of State just to give the um, Transport Secretary an overview of those, sub of those projects, where they're at and what they, what, what government needs to do to help us accelerate those further. And I think I heard quite clearly, obviously, they need to just make sure we can get on with the delivery rather than having to keep going back to central government for decision making. So we've got a track record delivery, let us get on with it and we can deliver quite quickly for you in a, a good and fair way. Uh, and also in the recommendations talks about NPR Acceleration Board, which I'm very pleased to see as well. Um, just with TRU and the board, we, we need boards of people coming together because these are massive pieces of infrastructure and you can't leave it to one organisation just to deliver on their own. It needs to be all of us working together. So those boards are, are key to making sure that happens. Any more questions or comments on that list uh, before we move on to the next item? No? Well, if everybody's happy with those recommendations, I'm happy to propose them. Can I see all these in favour, please show? Thank you, that is carried. So, um, next uh, next two items, really, uh, something that's very close to all our hearts, and we've discussed them several times before. In fact, we had a workshop uh, a few weeks ago on this. Uh, bus serv service revenue funding and expenditure and bus service improvement plan updates, and then obviously going on to the network plan development work that we're doing. Um, Dave, do you want to start this? Yes, I'll, I'll take the first paper um, initially. Um, and I, I think this is really an update to you uh, of the issues we've, we've raised um, with you previously in terms of the funding for bus services. In, in the in the region um, and in in the country generally, um, I think it's uh, it's fair to say that the uh, the bus network hasn't fully recovered from the pandemic in terms of the numbers of people travelling, um, and the uh, economy and inflation is uh, is impacting on this industry as it is on on most industries. So that's putting quite a lot of cost pressure into the uh, into the piece. The um, the government have been funding bus services throughout the pandemic and and um, and continue to do so, um, albeit sort of at um, a fairly short notice in terms of, of understanding the uh, the continuation of the funding. So um, we yeah, we now have funding from government from uh, from October to December, uh, and strong indication that uh, it, that'll be there from January to March, but no indication of any funding beyond that. So there's there is still a, a funding gap in the bus service. Um, it's been partly plugged by, by government funding and there's sort of uncertainty which uh, is, is, is making it quite difficult both for transport authorities like the combined authority and for bus operators to um, to, to plan ahead. Um, the, the impact particularly of inflation um, is, is having its effect on the combined authorities expenditure on bus services and this report sets, sets out that, that out um, and some of the 
pressures that I think we've reported previously to you and to the Combined Authority. We've had to move some money around budgets to accommodate some of the additional costs, and this paper sort of sets out the consequences that, that, um, that arose when CT Plus Yorkshire went out of business, uh, which is our largest school bus operator and access bus operator and so we've set out uh, you know what we've done about that and, and what the cost implications of that are so I think the um, the, the, the the paper sort of gives you an update and will keep keep you updating obviously we're going into a budget process now and it's quite a, a, a difficult budget process uh, across all of local government um, and cost pressures in in the in the bus budget is uh, is is going to be a, a sort of significant issue we'll need to to deal with. Uh, the report's recommending that the Chair uh, encourages the Secretary of State to, uh, to, to have a, a longer term funding plan for buses. Um, it's very difficult for us to plan that on the one hand, the next um, report we're going to talk about is bus service improvement plan, uh, where we have got some, some funds to improve bus services, but we also need to stabilise the baseline position to be able to do that. And at the moment, the baseline position is quite uncertain, given uh, that we, we don't know what the, um, the, the funding arrangement is beyond the end of March. And yet, it would seem that um, the travel habits have changed significantly, and that's impacting upon the revenues. So uh, there's lots of detail on the report. I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I mean, certainly we were very relieved when the government said they were going to extend the bus service recovery grant by another six months. I was less relieved when I found out it was only guaranteed for three months. <laughs> and they were going to, uh, the other three months was subject to what they considered the most needy areas. Now, I obviously think in West Yorkshire, as I'm sure I'm joined by all my colleagues, in thinking this is a very <coughs> needy area. So um, we, we do need that extending. Um, but um, it, it is just, you know, postponing things isn't it really because I am very concerned what happens after that three six months where people are very much dependent on the bus network and uh, we need to sustain that service but it does require government to provide that long-term funding really I've seen a few hands indicating uh, I've got councillor McLaughlin sorry thank you chair um well pronounced um just a, a couple, couple of points of clarification, really, on um, agenda item two point six about CT plus and the and the, the work that you've done. And clearly, I'd just like to say before I start, thank you very much for the hard work that's obviously gone into trying to save this mess. Um, I can see it, and it's appreciated. But just under the bullet point that says school buses, CT plus provided forty one school bus services. Arrangements have been made with other bus operators to provide these services from the start of the financial year. Does that mean that? those buses aren't going to be available to schools until April. Oh, it's an error. It's right. been tackled every I, year. I thought Apologies. it might be. I just wanted to clarify <laughs> I that. I didn't spot that. And um, the second point, all but six of these services have been secured at the current price. Does that mean that there are still six contracts yet to be awarded? Or they have been awarded, they were just more expensive? They were just more expensive. Right. Um, but I think we, we were quite fortunate to be able to, to, to deal with that element of it reasonably contained within the budget. Um, but, but yes, we... Um, we, we've we managed to cover everything. There was a little bit of a hiatus of one or two things early in the uh, in the first week or so of the school year, but uh, but they got to to where we need to be in terms of covering everything. Thank you, and yeah, just like to swing my full support behind the recommendation to write to the Secretary of State because we can't keep just plastic in plastering for three months, six months at a time. We need sustainable long term funding from any government, even if it is this government, so we can start bloody planning a service that will work for people. That's more of a ramp than a point, but never mind. Now, we've forgiven Councillor McLaughlin. Um, it is indeed uh, something that obviously is uh, a service that so many people across West Yorkshire rely on just to get to work, uh, and we need to be able to sustain that. Councillor Jones? Uh, yeah, I too, um, Chair, thank uh, you writing to the government regarding the uh, recovery funding. Uh, the area I represent is the southeast of Wakefield, which is the least connected um, area for transport, and it's one of the most socially deprived areas in West Yorkshire, and I am really concerned. We've already seen uh, a massive reduction in our services. Uh, Arriva, we are wholly reliant on Arriva, who have cut quite a lot of services. So we do really need this funding from the government to plug our services in an area which where we need people to get to work. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, we all were relieved um, to have the extension of the bus recovery grant, but Wakefield uh, has suffered particularly badly, hasn't it, regardless of that extension funding? Yes, I, I think uh, 
as, as Councillor Jones says, we, we, we do uh, recognise the fact that the, the bus network in South East Wakefield um, and the cross-boundary links and, and the selling does need a, a close looking at and to a certain extent in, in, in the later paper in terms of net bus network review, I think it, it, what, what jumps out of that is, is there are a number of areas where um, where there are some sort of acute issues uh, and, and there's not many areas where people would say they're absolutely satisfied with the bus service but there's some areas where, uh, where, where, where sort of connectivity is impacting on, uh, on, on, on people's lives and on the economy and I think uh, you know, that's the work that we are doing in terms of what the bus network should look like uh, does need to focus on those areas. Councillor Jones, you might want to come back in later when, with that paper. Um, I've got, you can put your hands up because it, I'm seeing them at different times. Uh, right, I'll try and remember that. Councillor, uh, I think I had Councillor Swift first and then Councillor Salam. Yeah, I mean, as, as has been said, I think Arriva have very much jumped the gun in Wakefield in, in the sense of having heavily anticipated an April situation now. Uh, to some extent, I'm sympathetic with Arriva, to some extent, not. Um, Sympathetic in the sense that if, if you think the money's going to disappear in April, to some degree, it's not surprising that bus operators tend to say, right, well, what's, which way are we going? Um, to some extent, I'm not at all sympathetic with her either. A, because the cutbacks um, that they are being done at a stage when hopefully the funding will continue. But um, secondly... Um, a little bit, uh, how shall I say, a little bit misleading in the sense that they have been doing quite a lot of cuts over the last couple of years, all of which have been stated to be temporary due to driver shortage or this and that, but temporary. The way in which Arriva have announced their current round makes no reference at all to the temporary cuts, i.e., the situation post-temporary cuts is treated as the base point. So they're already baked into the system and then the further cutbacks come afterwards. The other worrying thing about the Arriva cuts, the ones now, the 3rd of October, is that they've set out an explicit rationale behind it. Um, comparable, comparable to many of our aspirations, except going in exactly the opposite direction. They've explicitly stated um, that they're looking at a network that doesn't attempt to serve the areas off the main roads very much, that basically sticks to the main roads. They've explicitly stated they regard anything before 7 o'clock as early morning and subject to cuts. Maybe not too surprising. They've treated anything after 6 now, as evening, so where you get a drop between daytime and evening, in many instances, that is at six. There's exceptions dotted up and down the piece, but that is not only the general pattern, that is what they explicitly state as the approach that they've adopted. And without straying on to the bus service improvement plan, the Arriva strategy you could almost stand the bus service improvement plan aspirations on their head. Arriva are going in exactly the opposite direction. Thank you. I mean, that's, I'll take that as a comment rather than a question, really, yeah. Councillor Swift, because um, obviously I think we all share your concern that bus service improvement is great, but if you're taking a bus recovery grant away, then actually, you know, you're probably taking government are taking more money away from buses than they're giving them and therefore that ends to the net effect of that is a reduced service everywhere and I think what we're seeing in Wakefield is something that could quite quickly be replicated in other parts of the region and more so in fact and, and we're all acutely aware of that and doing everything we can to make sure that government are re uh, realise this and realise how important buses are part of growth. Uh, Councillor Slam, I've got Councillor Clark. Thank you Chair. Uh I think, Kevin, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, we've always played second fiddle to, to railways. You know, uh, all the investments are actually going into, in, into rail, which, which is needed, and, 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 and I'm not arguing about that funding. But the bus services have always been second fiddle to rail and, and the investment. And to be honest with you, to trickle feed, you know, the, 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 the most important transport network that's in, in every region, it's just beyond my belief. Three months is nothing 
is nothing. And that dark cloud is still all over, uh, over us. The lists are ready and, and, and some of the additions have been made to those lists. Um, so the enhanced partnership, but we've got to use our, our, our links in there and, and make sure. Uh, because even on, on, on page 23, you know, I mean, we were talking about earlier on, the most, the, the areas that get hit most are the deprived areas. That's where the services are actually being cut. The main arteries are not affected as much because everybody just comes on to them. It's the connections from where they are needed, whether it's employment, whether it's you know, uh, health, whether it's, it's, it's shopping. Those are the areas that are actually most mostly deprived. And for me, the whatever we say to the government at this moment of time, we've got to make sure that our the way we say it, it makes a difference because I think in the past, They've just actually looked at the letter, or they're asking for funding, and it, whether it goes into the bin or not, I'm not really sure. Um, and, the, and the other worry that I have is currently, a lot of the services that are actually being cut, people are moving to other modes of you know, uh, travel, whether it's car, whether it's walking, or whether it's cycling. And in the next paper, we are actually talking about increasing services and, 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 and the frequency of services. You can actually increase the services, but if there's no passengers, they, they won't survive. And that's what currently is happening. And I know we are at nearly 80% of what pre-COVID was. But a lot of the services have been cut back from 10 minutes to 15, 15 to 20, and from half an hour to an hour services, especially at night time and early in the mornings. And that's why people... And the reliability is massively, you know, I mean, affected at this moment of time. And we always talk about not having enough drivers, and I've actually changed my tone now. We've got more than enough drivers. What we need to do is create enough good jobs for those drivers to take on. Because it's a competitive marketplace, basically. Um, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> Um, having reading, having read through the report, it, it paints quite an, an interesting and quite dire picture in some places. It's um, and, and I must I must say, officers have played a very interesting juggling trick with certainly some of the budgets, including the um, uh, concessionary fare budget. It, it seems obviously three million has been taken out for various um, uh, inflationary cost pressures. Um, assume I, I can only assume being offset by the uh, projected underspend of six million from the. Uh, from the uh, positive variance, from the underspend of the uh, concessionary passes um, budget, a part, a portion of that budget. Uh, and where that other three million has gone, I can only assume uh, has been taken out of the, the mayor's two pound price cap, which in the next report is obviously marked at three million pounds. So it's a bit of an interesting juggling act there, but it seems, it seems rather odd that the, um, the authority has taken this stance when um, Points 2.11 to 2.17 have, have laid out some very, very dire uh, inflationary cost pressures, obviously outside the, uh, the, the parameters of the authority. Uh, and that sort of justification is, is quite baffling in the way we can uh, really look at making those cuts where obviously these quite, uh, quite significant increases in costs uh, are affecting buses and, of course, obviously sectors nationally. Uh, so, I, I, so some clarification on those points would be uh, would be helpful, Jeff. So can you. I just also I'll leave officers just to clarify the thirty three million? But do you, are you saying that there shouldn't have been cuts to fares? Is that what you're saying? It's the um, I'm, I'm trying to understand the the, the logic uh, of where we've taken out of the the clearly been a positive variance created for the underspend of the um, uh, forecast of the underspend of where the um, the concessionary passes uh, budget has been has produced that positive variance, but where that three million pounds has been taken out of through inflationary cost pressures, the other three million, I assume, has been sucked up by the two pound cap. But again, I'm, I'm, I, my question is whether that uh, three million was the best use of that fund, where these large in, inflationary pressures continue to be a problem. Okay, so I think I, I think he's saying he doesn't like the the cut in fares because if it's paid for that purpose. Um, of course, just to make the point that obviously 
government was very keen for us to reduce fares as well as part of the BSIP. So um, that that is something that obviously we've got growing costs of living and therefore uh, we're all trying to support people through these difficult times. Dave, do you want to take a Yes, I do. I, I, and I can see how it is a little bit of a, a moving beast, this, in, in terms of the different things that are happening in the budget. Um, the the concessionary fare budget is is currently under spending um, and that sort of takes us back into the the sort of pandemic arrangements because essentially um, if we were actually paying concessionary fares on actual use particularly through the, the pandemic and even now uh, where concessionary fare past use is actually lower than the 80 percent that councillor Salah mentioned in the certain paper um, then um, we would be paying out significantly less to bus operators but one of the arrangements which was made nationally uh, was that local authorities uh, paid uh, bus operators at a um, at the rate that we they were paying before the pandemic so that that, that kept the cash flow to the, the bus operators during the particularly uh, quiet times of, uh, of the lockdowns and that, that arrangement is still in place um, what then happened I think councillor Salam sort of mentioned it in, in his piece, is that um, some bus operators reduced frequencies. Um, if they reduced frequencies from 10 minutes to 15 minutes, then we've made actually a compensatory adjustment in, the, in what we pay them on concessionary fares to accommodate the fact that they're actually running a little bit less service. And that's actually created and developed a bit of a surplus in that budget area. But it is very much a, a um, short-term situation based upon um, the current arrangements. Um, uh, and that's enabled us to um, to essentially uh, deal with the sort of three million pound additional costs that have come our way this year on the on the cost side of that equation because um, because we've we've we're running at a surplus on the concessionary fares piece. There's a, then in the second the next paper, um, but I can see how this is confusing um, because we, we've offset three million against against an almost six million um, sort of underspend position. Um, that also enables us to do the mayor's fares arrangement ahead of receipt of the government's funding uh, from the bus service improvement plan. And so essentially we're using that money um, to, um, to pay for the first few months of it. Um, and then when the bus service improvement plan money comes in, then we can put that money back and, and the, um, the reduced fares will be wholly funded through the, um, through the bus service improvement plan funding. Um, and so because we're running with a surplus on this particular budget, it means we can do that without any impact on other budgets in, in, the, uh, in the authority. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just a clarification on the recommendation first when we 10.1, uh, uh, urging clear funding plan for bus services. Will that include some clarity <laughs> on super bus funding, please? Because that's something which may have light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Arriva is something I think we have all in common here, that the situation certainly over the last month is untenable. Um, the way that they've changed the services, leaving um, commuters and certainly from my post bag, a lot of young people isolated. In North Kirklees, you could almost think that Arriva were picking on the mayor because I've had quite a number of parents and students from Hetman Dwight Grammar School getting in touch, which was the mayor's alma mater, saying that they are now, because of the changes, they're having to leave home at five past seven for an 8.40 start, because if they go for the next bus, they're late for registration. Consequently, at the other end of the day, the return bus home is 3.30 when the school finishes at 3.15. And Reva have said they think it's reasonable in 15 minutes for students to get from Hetman Wright Grammar School to Hetman Wright Town Centre. Talking to some of the parents, this totally ignores the fact that students could be on one side of the campus to the other. They could be doing a games lesson, or as one parent said, my daughter's a musician, so she has to go to the other end of school because she can't carry a music instrument round and then get down. On a number of occasions, uh, I've got an email here dated the 11th of October, the 261-1530 departure was a no-show from Heckman Dry Club to Murfield. The girls had to catch the 229 
get off at Leeds Road and walk down Sunnybank Road. So some of those live probably two or three miles away from that bus stop. Again, it's an untenable situation that Arriva uh, are putting people in. It's not going in any way to encourage uh, bus patronage. Um, as the, the resident says to me, uh, they've had an email from the, uh, the combined authority mayoral office. It doesn't address the issues which we as parents have raised and goes on about the blooming two pound fare. I don't care about the two pound fare. All I want for is for my child to get to school on time and for her not to be out of the house at 7.05 in the morning when she doesn't start at 8.40. I think we ought to be asking these questions about how can Arriva plan a service when they're not taking into account the needs of its passengers. What was happening is those parents having to now shuffle their working days and put cars on the road. We're finding that um, people who work, there was a 229, which should have got passengers into Leeds, uh, I think it's called Globe Street, at the other end of Wellington Street, for uh, 8.45, so that people could be in the office by 9 o'clock. It didn't get until half past 9. So those people are not going to put up with that disruption to their working pattern and the possible implications for long. They're going to be leaving that. And it's something that we, as an authority, should be mindful of looking at data that's produced. Kirklees exports 19,700 people into Leeds to work. In return, Leeds sends us back 7,000. We can't expect all of those to go on the train. It's not convenient for many of them, obviously from wide areas of Kirklees. And as Taj has said, the, the bus is often seen as a poor relation when it can be, um, you know, it can fill that gap. Again, the, the cuts to the service and Part of this, I've emailed officers about, the 229 um, had changes proposed from 3rd of October. I think we got something like a, is it a month's notice to give us, Dave, something like that. As of Wednesday, a bus stop in Hartshead, which is where Tracy used to live when she was an MP, still had a timetable up displaying bus fares for a non-existent bus service. So people could be stood at a remote bus stop looking for something that's not going to come. Metro throw, uh, sorry, Ariba throw this back and say it's Metro, it's a combined authorities problem to, to do the, um, the timetables, which, okay, now that needs looking at. The other thing, and again, it's commonality that uh, we face, is when we are talking about the delays in buses, Ariba have said uh, in respect of this, frustratingly, with no compensation to operators, and an expectation will soak up the cost of extra resources in the cycle, poor planning lacks partnership. The districts need to be held accountable for traffic delays due to controllable factors on their road network. I think we need to be having some very direct conversations with Arriva, the districts, and say, right, what is the issue here? You know, if there are issues of traffic delays and their controllable factors, let's look at how they can be resolved. Um, mentioned to, to colleagues that in Kirklees we've got uh, works on the primary road, the A62. That's going to be a long-term issue because we're, we're funding through Wyker Cooper Bridge. But again, it's not beyond the wit of man to redevelop a bus service that then starts beyond Cooper Bridge. If that's where the delay is, they could alternate Huddersfield and Cooper Bridge starts, as they do now. They have starts at Heckman Drive Hub, so that people are not being isolated. We need to look at our customers, our passengers, and make sure that we're not disenfranchising people who are now then being pushed back onto using cars, coming into places like Leeds and Bradford and facing high charges to do so when they don't really have an alternative. I think as an authority, we need to be sitting down having frank conversations with everybody who's signed up for the Enhanced Partnership. We all have something to play in that, and we all need to look at how we can resolve it for the benefit of, re of uh, the parents and students that are writing these terrible letters. Thank you. So um, I think it needs to be said that obviously Mayor Braben is sitting down with operators on a regular basis and telling people exactly what she thinks uh, and trying to uh, knock heads together. Um, I think all the things you talk about in terms of um, delays, etc., Obviously, Wakefield colleagues would absolutely recognise some of the comments you make about Arriva and they're equally frustrated. But we also have to stand back as a West Yorkshire region and say, this system is broken. Um, 
I'm afraid all the bus operators are trying to cut costs to try and eke out their businesses. And we're left with a situation where we started this discussion item with actually needs to be some sustained funding for buses to deliver a decent service. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be all shouting at each other, pointing fingers locally, when actually, I'm afraid, the whole system doesn't work anymore. And that's something we recognised ourselves as a committee, that it needs proper sustainable funding. Where's that coming from? Uh, and, and that's what, I'm afraid, government are so busy with the crisis at the moment, they're not looking at the big picture, the long term, which is where is that sustained funding going to come from? Um, can you just, Dave, can you just ask, answer the question about the bus stop information in particular that Councillor Bolt mentioned? Then I'll yeah, go to yeah so I'm, the two things, I think uh, 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 I'll go back and check with colleagues. I'm, uh, I was vaguely aware of the Heckman Dwight school timing issue, and I, I think that is being talked about with the <laughs> I'll find out where that's got to. In terms of the bus stop uh, information, that is. Uh, is our, our team's responsibility. Um, it, it normally takes about a week or so to, to work through all the bus stops that we need to change after our service change. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll check out Hart's head one, but uh, I suspect it might be being done almost as we speak. So, um, so uh, but yeah, it's always a bit of a, when, but when operators do lots of changes, um, we have several thousand bus stops to change. Um, and it, it, you know, we, I'm not going to say they're always bang on the day, I'm afraid. Um, but, um, but we'll just make sure that uh, something's going out there. Councillor Carroll. Thanks, Chair. I mean, it, it comes back, one, to some of that conversation we're having about planning, and two, um, just in support of some of the work that happened, the officers had to do, because I think what people that aren't involved in the day-to-day -day of this won't know is that that extension to the funding actually came the day that the operators had to register these changes. So, uh, I mean, it came to the point where FIRST had actually officially registered the changes they were going to make had the funding not extended and had to scrabble around withdrawing all the ones they could now afford to do. Uh, obviously, in that same case, officers were spending their time trying to cover this massive list of changes that may have come in to find that then, the very day they were ready for um, announcing those, there was a whole different ball game. So we talk about three, six months being a, a, a short-term uh, idea of, of, of the funding on this. But in fact, it was yeah, two hours in some cases that, that people had. And that's where we end up with this really difficult situation of working out how we sustain a bus network that people can rely on. And that's what we're all talking around here. Um, the operators, there's a lot that I have criticised operators for at various times, but in this one, they have worked as, as fast as they could to get a certain position. Whether that's a position we're happy with, I'm not sure, but they've come up with a certain position on it. It's really difficult at that point that they have to do that in one day suddenly and make that list um, and suddenly have to scrabble around with, with officers to do that. So I think really, I mean, maybe you could remind them in your chair, uh, in your letter chair, that, that that's the kind of timescales we're working with and that we can't cope with that. And six months is one point, but really the, we need to know what's going to be there for the next couple of years yeah. to work out. You know, you put, a, you put a route on. If you don't know that route's going to work and what we want to do with patronage, we want to put on routes that then we can grow the patronage on those routes and market them well. And, and we've got things like the fair initiative that will encourage people to use those routes. That means we need to know that they're going to be there for more than six months and that the funding's not suddenly going to be pulled out. So completely support the recommendation on that one. But, but I wonder whether some of those points can go in the letter. Taking a note of those, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, because transport makes up such a large proportion of the carbon emissions across, across West Yorkshire, um, and we know the length of time it takes for the infrastructure for rail and for major road improvements to take place, the bus service is really a key plank. It's so much more flexible and rapid that it can be brought into action, that we really need to be making the best use of it <coughs> as possible. Part of it is fares, and I really welcome the reduction in fares that have been announced. But the other part, as my colleagues have mentioned, is the uh, reliability. And there are still far, far too many services being cancelled at short notice on the grounds that the operators say that they don't have the drivers to support them, notwithstanding Councillor Salam's uh, assertion that there's enough drivers, something is not happening. 
um, the combined authority is subsidizing driver training. Do, do we have any update on the effectiveness of that subsidy? Uh, obviously, it will be a moving target to some, to some extent in terms of retaining staff, staff as well. But do we know whether we're getting the appropriate return on that investment and whether we're able to hold the uh, bus operators to accountability for their staffing levels so that we can return to having a reliable service? Uh, yes, I mean, we, um, as recently as yesterday, and, and, and I, uh, as president with the mayor, when she met with First, for example, and, and we were really pushing the bus operators to, to be absolutely transparent about their driver position in terms of the numbers of people that you know, they're, they're employing, um, the numbers of people they need, and, the, and what the gap is. Um, uh, that particular company is saying the gap's shortening. So, um, uh, so uh, they, we also discussed the, um, the, the training support that, that has been given. And, and uh, in, in their instance, there's, um, and we'll collect the, the numbers together and, and report back to you. Um, they've, um, they've had 10 extra drivers that came through that particular route. There are all other routes that, uh, that they get new drivers from. Um, and uh, I think, as, as Councillor Salam probably bear out, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a time lag in, in recruiting drivers and training drivers up, and they do lose drivers in that, in that sort of churn um, that, that they don't uh, follow the, the course. But I think it is important to actually get a clear picture, um, and we stress this with, with bus operators now, as to the extent to which the, you know, the driver problem was quite crisis uh, nine months ago, um, that it, it shouldn't be quite the same crisis now. Um, and if bus services are being cancelled, um, then we need to get under the skin of what that's about, because driver shortage is probably one factor um, involved in that. And I think that's um, it's important and it's well, well, um, well understood that um, returning some um, confidence and some reliability into the bus network, even a smaller bus network, is actually really quite crucial um, for, for, uh, for us to be able to go forward, both with the bus service improvement plan, but, but for them as well, um, in terms of, of their businesses. So, yeah, we are sort of pushing quite strongly with bus operators to be actually clear and transparent throughout their driving position. I think just to add as well, we're very keen to have uh, bus corridors. So when we talk about CRSTS, it's really important we prioritise the bus corridors and the segregated busways because it gives that more reliability because the buses can get around more easily. Um, I've got, um, now I've got Councillor Butt and I've got Councillor uh, Thompson. Can you hear me now? Um, it's just on the point about the grammar school that Councillor Bolt made. Um, the Hampton Road Grammar School is actually in my ward. I wasn't actually aware of these issues. The reason why is because people that live in Hampton Road generally either walk or get dropped off by the parents, which is a, a, another issue that we have with all the congestion. Um, so we don't have many people throughout Hampton Road that use the bus to get to the school. However, um, I think um, Dave did mention that there would be some information coming out around that particular route. If there is, if there is anything that's been worked on I, that. I think, yeah, we, we, um, we put these, so th th this is an issue of timing of buses, I think, as, as Councillor Bolt said, and, and um, I believe that's been looked at, to, uh, in, even if m not more service can be put on, but if, if the timing of it can be improved, then, uh, th then it, it would address that issue, but I, I'll need to see where colleagues have got to on that particular point. My answer generally was that if, if that is being looked at and um, if there is any information on it, if I could copy it in as well, please, so that I may get uh, up to date on that. Thank you. Yes, it sounds like it's a school that serves a, a wide area, not necessarily your residence, but obviously it's in, in your area, so it will impact on you. 90% of the um, students are actually out of area because um, it's a selective grammar school. So. Um, they'll need to run a bus service then, won't they, which I thought was the point. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, related on both reliability and schools. Our local schools often don't have a school bus service because they have public transport available locally, but that public transport is unreliable. So children are now arriving at school and being penalised for being late because the bus company is unable to provide a service that shows up on time. They might have to set off half an hour early, as others do, because the bus 
may or may not show up. It's too far to walk. Parents are sometimes having to get children to multiple schools and colleges um, with different transport issues in all directions. And they simply cannot rely on the bus to get them to school. People cannot rely on the bus to get them to work because it'll be cancelled, it'll be cut short. And all I get from first is excuses. And it's tiresome. And every day we have reports of people late back from work after 12 hour shifts, can't get to work, having to pay for taxis, maybe being told, oh, you can claim for a taxi for your last bus. If you can't pay for it, how are you supposed to get it and claim back for it? Um, I appreciate some work's going on on reliability, but the bus companies do not want to give us the data. I've been asking for weeks, nothing, just absolute silence. Sorry, a rant and probably a comment more than a question, but thank you. It's a very polite rant, Councillor Thompson, um, politely made. I think, and obviously we've got a passenger experience report on here as well, but this is quite light on the bus stuff, isn't it, really? Which, I mean, can we get, can we get something more? Yes, we, we, we normally include in that report um, a three monthly update on, on overall bus reliability and, and we'll make sure that gets back to in, in the next report. That is a bit of a rolled up um, across the whole um, region type of, of report. Um, and yes, I'd say um, bus operators are quite sensitive about having route specific reliability information in the public domain, but in, in terms of the generality, then yes, we don't normally include that in that report. So uh, uh, I think they'll probably be in the next one, but um, it's quite well made. So I think in the next one, it'd be good to see um, a more comprehensive stats about bus performance and also, uh, as Councillor Hutchins said, about the performance of the, the driver um, training that we're supporting yeah. and how that's going. Yeah. And if we should be adjusting that in any way, shape or form, it's fast moving times, we have to remain flexible. So with that, um, can I just uh, propose a recommendation there, which obviously is right in just, just to say that we, we do need more sustained funding for buses um, from government, because we all know ourselves, operators, passengers, need to know that there's going to be a bus there, not just before Christmas, but after Christmas as well. That's a quite a realistic yeah, expectation. Yeah. Yeah, have we got anything on superbus? Yeah, the the um, the superbus is an element within the bus service improvement plan, which is the next report. But um, so to a certain extent, that that's um, that's now how you know with us um, within the bus service improvement plan. So uh, that's not something we're waiting for government from, um, but um, but obviously we can talk about how we how we move that forward. Um, but um, but yeah, I think the the the, um, the main issue in terms of uh, of that recommendation is is to is to give some sort of long term um, plan around a bus funding so um, to both the uh, the combined authority and the bus companies uh, can um, can apply some planning um, in terms of the things we do next. So perhaps if we can leave the letter as it is, Councillor Bolt, from that purpose, and but move move it onto this paper, which obviously sounds more relevant. So um, this is the other half of the story. Um, albeit we, we are aware that it doesn't give us everything that we're going to be losing through the bus recovery grant. So, Dave. Yes, um, this is one of those papers actually that, um, that that's a sort of uh, updated version of what you would have got if had there been a meeting in, in September. And I think uh, what, uh, what, what, what this sets out is, uh, I think as, as probably most members are, are now aware, um, we were successful in, that, in that, our a representation to the um, bus service improvement plan program that the government ha has uh, uh, set out um, and we've got an indicative settlement of just sort of, of 70 million revenue funding over three years so that, that's um, and, and obviously that's uh, that's enormously helpful to help deal with some of the issues we've just been talking about um, the, um, the the report sort of sets out the, the next sort of next steps in the process really in terms of how um, how we would deal with it and, and manage it um, and what the report's recommending is that uh, this committee will oversee the delivery of the, uh, the bus service improvement plan subject to uh, uh, the combined authority approving that at its meeting next Friday. Um, so um, so we will um, periodically be bringing you um, as a transport committee uh, up to speed with uh, the various different stages of the, the bus service improvement plan is going through and, and uh, I think, as we said earlier, the um, the funding for that comes when the enhanced partnership is formally uh, 
constituted. Um, we're in process with that um, and expect to have the, uh, the bus service improvement plan uh, uh, sort of constituted by early November, and with, by which case uh, that um, enables the Department of Transport to issue the grant award letter, um, and then um, we, we bring the funding through the assurance process and the, and the approvals from the various uh, different elements of it. Um, to address the, the cost of living crisis and to, um, to, to move, move quicker than that, than that process for the reduction in fares, the Mayor's Fares Initiative was introduced in, uh, in, in the beginning of September, um, uh, as, as is set, set out. And that, that, that's using bus service improvement plan uh, funding, but uh, as I explained to, to Councillor Clark's question, um, a decision has been taken to, uh, to, to, to bring that forward so that we can introduce it in time for the new academic year and for a term for time for um, autumn, which is which tends to be a busier time that uh, people use buses on in. Um, so that's now in place um, and it is a temporary measure. measure. I think as I described earlier, it's been funded from combined authority budgets until such time as that money comes through. Um, so that, that this paper um, sort of sets out uh, that, that sort of process and and it's early days in terms of the um the take up and use of that but i think you know we, we can uh, we can sort of safely say that you know, around ten thousand people each day are actually paying less for their bus fares than they were earlier on the year um and um and what we need to do is start tracking to see if that's actually attracting more people onto the bus um and so um we uh, we've set a sort of three month period um and then we'll we'll bring some uh, some detailed analysis of, uh, of the results of that after three months. Um, so the the, the paper is actually recommending that this committee takes on the the sort of oversight of the bus service improvement plan, um, and that we come back to you with an analysis of the uh, first three months of the mass fares operation. Thank you very much. So. Um, in summary, uh, it could be a lot worse because actually some areas of this country have not got any of bus service improvement money from government. Um, so at least we've got this. It might not be enough to make up for the bus recovery grant, but at least it's something. Um, and I think the whole point of the bus service improvement plan is trying to increase patronage. The more we get more people on the buses, the more financially viable they become, and then they don't need as much public subsidy. So that's the whole drive, get people onto the buses, whether that's with fares, reliability, new routes, the whole gamut, that's what we're trying to do here. But have we got time to do that? Is government going to give us the money to, to do that? Because it's going to take a few years to be able to, to build that pattern up after the pandemic. So I've got Councillor Buckley and and now Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor Walt. Right. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Two questions, if I can. Um, first of all, specifically on the, the bus service improvement plan, um, the chairman has just um, confirmed again, but we, were, we heard last time the same thing, that the, this improvement plan money must not be used to substitute trying to subsidise the cancellation of routes or the reduction of frequency and that kind of thing. And obviously you can see the logic in that. You don't want to dilute the thing away from what it's designed for. So do the terms of having received the £70 million pounds, set out explicitly what can and cannot be done. That's question number one. Be because if they don't say you can't fudge it, and you, you, you could, in theory, use it to stop the 25 going to a one-hourly service, what's the, it, it, it's too vague. So I would like confirmation, please, that it must be used for specifically an improvement plan. So the plan uh, activity has to be itemised, costed, presented and approved. Um, for example, Councillor Hinchcliffe herself knows about the, the classic case of the um, bus stop on the avenue in Old Woodley, uh, which would be a perfect a uh, small improvement of the bus service and it would also enhance safety and everybody's happiness in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a boast, Councillor Bill, actually. <laughs> but particularly my ward. Um, but, uh, so I'd like clarification on that, please. 
But then secondly, um, and again, this is not just my word, it's the whole of Leeds. Going back to the former Council of Blake's agreement with FIRST, they promised us 284 Euro 6, all singing eco-friendly buses. And we've only had 189. And I bring this up at every opportunity. And officers say to me, yeah, oh, well, yes, um, I shall follow that up, uh, Councillor. And uh, we talk to them regularly, you know. Uh, well, that's very nice, but where are these 90 odd? And in reality, because of the condition that the bus companies are now in, for understandable reasons, what are the prospects of actually receiving these vehicles? What are the guarantees and what are the sanctions? And what happens, given that the other side of the equation is that we provided them with bus lanes, uh, enhanced uh, bus gates and all the rest of it? We did our bit, but we haven't had... We've got this deficit of 94 buses. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, so, obviously, at the beginning of this process, it was the BSIP was very much for enhancements, and the government was very, very clear on that. I think they're less clear on that now, aren't they, Dave? May, Dave may have some up-to-date information on that. It, it's not... In, in the, the, the government letter we've had, it's not as, perhaps, black and white as, as Councillor Buckley would, would ideally like. Um, but I think the... the um, and we haven't seen the, the full grant agreement, but um, I think the, the presumption is that um, this funding is there to, uh, to, to, to to basically enhance the network as it stands at the moment. Um, uh, and so um, I, I, it, whatever you do to enhance the bus network, you, you to, you, to a certain extent, may be actually putting something back that was there at some point before. So, um, so it's not quite as hard and fast as... Um, uh, as is that, but I think the the approach that um, we're taking in, in West Yorkshire, and I think the approach that government uh, of officials are, are encouraging us to do is is to is to get the best value out of that money in terms of of, of what can can bring more people back to the bus. Uh, but it, it's um, and, and it's not there just to simply replicate services which were quite recently uh, withdrawn. Um, if I can. Then move to, to Councillor Buckley's point about the, the, the Leeds vehicles. Um, then, then the, the, um, the first are still confirming their uh, intention to honour the commitment that they made on those vehicles. Um, they have, they, um, the, the, they have experienced, and this is a, this is a known thing that um, the vehicle manufacturing industry um, has had its own issues during the um, the pandemic. Um, and suppliers had uh, and had significantly reduced their output, um, but uh, the number of of, of commitments um, and establish and, and reinforcing commitments have been made to, to make sure that um, that vehicle commitment will continue and and um, and be made good in the coming year. So I think and we've no reason to doubt that at this stage. Thank you very much, Councillor Clapham. Would you mind if I very, very briefly came back? Very brief, because we very, are, very, very, very buses is really important and we all want to say a lot on it. So yeah. just, the, just the improvement plan, so really, so let's just, um, no one's listening, so <laughs> let's just say... Can I just say people are listening? As this is recorded, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> let's just say that somebody decided to use some money from the bus services improvement plan to stop the 16A from wherever becoming a one hourly service only. What would the government do? They'd do nothing, would they? So we'd actually be using the improvement plan to do what it should well, be doing. I, I think what it, it is is that the, and the next paper on the agenda sort of sets out uh, our approach to doing that is that um, one of the things we do have to do with the personal service improvement plan money is, is to set out a network development plan. Um, and the, the spend of, of, of bus service improvement plan uh, is against a definite plan to to improve bus services. Uh, they, they wouldn't um, get into that sort of level of granularity in terms of whether bus service X and bus service Y was, was replicating something that might have happened one or two years ago. They won't get to that sort of level, but what we'll do, we'll do is uh, expect us to be able to demonstrate <coughs> the, the spending against a definite plan 
um, and and I think that's the the, the level that uh, DFT officials will will expect us to be able to demonstrate. So what you're asking for, Councillor Booker, is proper devolution. Government giving us the money and letting us get on with it. And I think we would all agree around the table that's a much better idea. Um, well, we, we are already, obviously, uh, for all the council taxpayers in West Yorkshire, are already contributing to the bus service, and we continue to do so. A lot of people don't realise that, but, of course, um, we all contribute about 7 or 8% of uh, our budgets to, to bus services in West Yorkshire. Councillor McLaughlin first. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just a couple of, a couple of points. Um, the first is, in the light of recent fiscal events, um, the government may well have to, the current government may well have to implement truly catastrophic public sector mm -hmm. spending cuts. And so I just I wanted to ask, I'm hoping that the answer to this is going to be the fact that we've been awarded it means it's safe, but how sure can we be of this £70 million? Is there a potential for the government to turn around and say, oops, sorry, we need that? Um, and the second point is on the mayor's fares. I know we're going to get a full report after three months, and quite right too. But is there any early indication of how uh, what impact fair fares is having on um, bus patronage? And I know it's only anecdotal, but I must say the last few buses I've got on in my area, I've noticed, oh, these are busier than they used to be. Um, and I'm hoping that that's not the wish being the father of the thought. But uh, yeah, just um, some clarity on those two points would be yeah. great. We we have a letter. <laughs> um, <laughs> from from. That. From the from, from from the department, well, from the secretary of state, I think. Yes, yes. Um, or the um, the minister. It's secretary of state. <laughs> I think it's Baroness Veer, who's actually oh, is still the same one. She's still there. Um, so, so I, we we do have a, a, a confirmation letter. Um, now, I, what 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 happens beyond then? I think we we all sort of uh, uh, can't really predict. But um, but I think you know, it, it's as. Um, it, it is, it's firm enough for us to have proceeded, and I think that's what this report's actually saying, is that it gives enough, enough confidence to be able to do what we've done with the, 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 the mayor's affairs. Um, I think we, we're all sort of seeing that the bus use is, has, has gone up in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, it was probably expected as well, um, because it's the time of year, and then the way I said earlier, that was why I wanted to get the mayor's affairs in early, was because this is the time of year where where bus patronage and public transport use generally, but uh, trains as well, tends to edge up um, in, as the weather gets colder. Um, people are maybe walking less and, and changing their, their, their journey happens. So um, so we, we do need to watch that carefully and, and at some point understand, um, and that might need some, some level of, uh, of market research as well, the, um, the motivation for people moving was it was it because of fares uh, or something. So we've got we've got some um, so, some sort of thinking to do around around that. But I think you know positive is that you do see uh, more people um, travelling in uh, and around by bus in the last couple of uh, weeks, and the bus operators are reporting that, and we're seeing that in the data. So um, at least it's going in the right direction. Um, so uh, so that, that's that's hopeful. Lovely. So if at the next meeting we can have some more comprehensive data on that, that would be really helpful just to see how that's impacting. Of course, there's all sorts of different things that lead to a successful, profitable bus service that's viable, uh, and that is definitely one element. And I think your comments uh, about, you know, can we rely on, on the letter? I mean, obviously, we, we all live in very uncertain times, aren't we? but this, you know, joking aside, it is very concerning, isn't it, that we're all very nervous at the moment about you know, public services being delivered consistently, having the funding to do that over time. And the more certainty we can have with that, the better. Uh, and I just make a plea for that. Uh, Councillor Carlo, you want to come? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, it goes back to Councillor Buckley's question, actually. And, and it, it was more just adding to Dave's answer. The one thing we have to be mindful of all the time is that that bus service improvement plan is quite clear that there is three years of money there. And after that, we are supposed to have made a viable network so i think that's more the answer that i take from that that should we use it to keep alive a service that an operator could just withdraw at the end of that well i don't think that does anything but the residents of Alwoodley in this case i think were we to look at Alwoodley and say well what is the best commercial and um uh, viable bus service that we can provide in there that provides the service that people want in the most sustainable way, then that's what we'd want to be using it for. To say then, right, well, we've seen where we predict passenger numbers will be on that. In three years, we think that'll be able to 
stand on its own two feet, go forward and we leave it with a legacy. And that's where that separation comes, I think, from just updating and, and, and um, continuing to fund routes that we haven't necessarily planned ourselves, mm -hmm. the ones that private operators have planned and, uh, and we can add a bit of funding to them where possible. But actually the bus service improvement plan, I think, allows us to say, well, what do we think is a good route in here? And then talk that through with operators and get that planned. And hopefully, if we do it right, then we end up with a good bus service that is better than it was before, that is more sustainable than it was before, and that won't just suddenly have the rug pulled out from under it like we've like we've seen in recent days. And all that for ten million pounds a year. <laughs> so that is a challenge, but definitely that's the ambition. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I think at the start of this, Dave, you, you said that the funding <coughs> comes along when the NANS partnership starts. Can I get some clarity then? Because the document for the Enhanced Partnership Scheme says the EP scheme is made on the 31st of March 2022 and shall come into operation on the 1st of April 2022. Then it says the EP scheme shall have an initial term of five years and be reviewed by the Combined Authority every six months, which would suggest we should be having the first review of the EP scheme on. Right. Unless there's some, unless it's like buses, you wait for ages and more than one Enhanced Partnership comes along at the same time. Yes. While we're bit, talking about a little bit like that. <laughs> while we're talking about funding, could I make a plea that the combined authority um, make sure we put in robust requests for major developments and reviews them when necessary? There's a scheme going through which has been through for a planning position statement at Kirklees at the moment called Chidswell, which is on the border of Dewsbury and Leeds. I understand from officers that the combined authority's submission, and some of that includes bus service funding, was made two years ago. Obviously, as we've heard, things change in a couple of hours nowadays. Um, but we should be making sure that if we are making a submission for a planning committee for a developer contribution, it's reviewed at the time, added for inflation or whatever, at the time it goes for decision. Uh, and again, as, uh, as I've asked, when the 229 was rerouted, I asked if we could have shelters and real-time information, and I was told that only if a developer pays for them. Well, seeing as the developments on Murfield Moor were passed about 10 years ago, if you didn't get the money then, you're not going to get it now. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, while we're looking at funding, developers should be paying their whack. So uh, clarity on how many hands end partnership and can we read both robust and developer contribution? I'm not sure you can do much about planning contributions, can you? It's not really your thing, is it? Um, it's a planning authority, is it, it not, it to, to negotiate is. that? Um, uh, sorry. The combined authority makes uh, is a, a voluntary, it's not a non statutory consultee, but it puts in requests for funding, such as on Chidswell, £300,000 for bus services. One of the things I've seen, I've been told that would not fund bus services very long in this climate. We'll bring Liz in on that one. So, Dave, do you want to do the Yeah, Yes, yes, and, and um, apologies if it's not clear in the report. It, it, there's, there's a certain sort of arcaneness of, of the, how the. the um, the Bus Services Act and the, the Enhanced Partnership Structure things work. Um, as Councillor Bolt quite rightly said, it, it, earlier this year we adopted something called an Enhanced Partnership Plan, which is how we would approach Enhanced Partnership, and we established an Enhanced Partnership Scheme um, for uh, essentially for, for managing newly built bus infrastructure. Um, the Department for Transport, as a condition of the Bus Service Improvement Plan, said that's fine and you've got, you've got an enhanced partnership structure in place, but we want an enhanced partnership scheme which actually um, contractualises the, um, the delivery of the Bus Service Improvement Plan. What I mean by contractualises it is it commits both the combined authority and the bus operators and the councils to doing the things it says in the Bus Service Improvement Plan. And that's a, a new enhanced partnership scheme which we... Um, we're going through the process now with, um, and um, and that's the one which will be established. So it, you're quite right, there, there is an enhanced partnership scheme already there, uh, but we need a very specific one that wraps all of the bus service improvement plan together. Um, and that's a, that's the major condition of, um, of, of the bus service improvement plan funding. Uh, so hopefully that clarifies, but I don't know whether, Helen, do you want to come in on that as well? I'll just add a little bit more to that. So um, to make a, an enhanced partnership scheme, you have to have an enhanced partnership plan in place. It's, it's technical governance arrangements, but effectively, so the plan was made with the first scheme in April, 
um, as for, for, to be on, in place on the 1st of April, which is what was required by government. And then, as Dave says, we have to make a sub subsequent scheme to en enable um, enactment of this money. So um, if the scheme is successful through statutory consultation, then we will be in a position to receive the funding um, on the back of that once the scheme is made. Thank you. And Lisa, do you want to come in the um, planning obligations and the combined authorities impact? Thank you. Um, so yes, we do, um, as Councillor Volt um, was suggesting, um, look at planning applications, not all of them, because there's quite a lot across the West Yorkshire. Um, we only have a small team, but we do look at them um, and um, advise um, the, the planning authority um, if we think there is bus infrastructure or bus services um, that, will, that ideally the developer would pay for. I was just trying to look to see if I could find out about Chidwell in particular. I can't. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have time whilst Dave was talking to do that. Um, so sorry, Councillor Bart, I don't know specifically where we are up to with the Chidwell, but maybe we can talk about this after the meeting. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. So, oh, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think, like I say, everyone in this meeting will welcome the, um, the, the fund, the bus improvement fund. Um, and possibly argue that it doesn't go far enough in some ways. Uh, and I would, of course, welcome a more detailed report on the uh, on the specifics of the funding uh, and how and how they uh, they would be pulled together. But one um, point I would like to make uh, is something that certainly affects my ward, but I know will affect uh, wards of many of the members around this table. Uh, is uh, that my ward is Craven Ward, which is very much uh, close to Skipton uh, and borders the uh, the North Yorkshire. Uh, authority. So uh, I would like uh, some details of how um, the bus service improvement plan would look at strengthening those links between uh, neighbouring authorities uh, and particularly buses between uh, this authority and others. Because I know it's certainly something that my residents uh, are very concerned about. I've got the same obviously from a Wakefield point of view as well. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it, in the generality um, the, the the bus um, network plan that 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 the subject of the next report is 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 to a certain extent how we um, how we look at the bus network in its entirety, including cross boundary links, and and how um, how we can sort of prioritise where we spend this bus service improvement plan to to get sort of best effects in terms of of, of moving that on. But I think it's 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 it's, it's well known um, at, at the, the fringes of West Yorkshire that um, there are particular um, travel patterns to, to neighbouring towns um, that are, are not particularly well served and whether that's to Skipton or to Barnsley uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the similar problems exist So we'll come on to that a bit Councillor Clark in the next, next paper I believe Councillor McLaughlin uh, Thank you Chair, yeah, uh, just on, uh, on uh, 3.1 in the agendas under tackling the climate emergency implications mm. it says uh, a key aim of the West Yorkshire Bus Service Improvement Plan is to support the decarbonisation of local bus, local bus network, and I'm sure that's something we can all agree on. I'm just conscious that there might be people listening or maybe even in the room who would like to hear a little bit more about how it might do that um, as by way of reassurance and inspiration. So I, I would appreciate some of that, please. We need some inspiration, Dave. <laughs> um, yes, um, I, I, it's probably a longer conversation, really, about um, the, the sort of trajectory to... Uh, to deliver a zero carbon fleet by 2036. I mean, I think we've spoken in this re report, in this meeting before, about the Zebra program, um, which is a, a funding to uh, to deliver 110 electric buses, um, and and then to follow that through in terms of uh, next stages to uh, to support the uh, the the sort of introduction of zero carbon buses. Um, on an understanding that you know, it, it's it's well recognised that that. Um, that start as a starting point, but it's certainly not the ending point, and there's quite a lot of thinking to do, and quite a lot of, of sort of thinking around how this is financed uh, over the longer period of time to uh, to get to a position where we've got a full zero uh, zero carbon bus fleet. Um, and the bus operators and the manufacturing industries are tooling up to converting over as well. Um, so um, that's probably a, a, a another topic for perhaps another day to, to actually flesh that out but I think the, the, um, the, the plans that we've got are um, to, to use this relatively short period of time at the beginning uh, with the bus service improvement plan the zebra funding to to at least start moving us along that journey. As we all know transport is a huge contributor to carbon emissions that's not good for any of us 
whether it's breathing or uh, a carbon climate emergency flooding. So it is something that absolutely priority we need to get on top of, and this hopefully will help help us deliver that. Um, any more questions on this paper before we move on to the network? No, in that case, can I propose recommendations that we have in the paper, uh, which includes, of course, that we're going to look at the bus service improvement plan delegated to this committee just to make sure it's delivering everything we, we would like it to, albeit it can't do everything, as we've already discussed. Uh, can I just see all those in favour, please show? Thank you. Thank you, that's carried. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure we actually voted on agenda item six. We proposed them, but I think uh, Martin came in with his superbus's comment and we forgot to actually vote. Distracting me there, Martin. In that case, uh, can we just see all those in favour of item six as well? Thank you, McLaughlin. Uh, take that as a promotion, Cass McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, uh, next item, and it is what we've already discussed, which is the bus network plan uh, development update. Um, we have talked a little bit about that already. Um, Helen, Dave? Uh, we've probably open it up for, con for any, con any discussion really. I, I think uh, some, some of you had a, a workshop around this uh, last month. That's more than our and, homework. And, um, and so <laughs> this is bringing you back some of the thinking there. It's a work in progress and useful to, to get any, any, any thoughts that, uh, that members have. So just to encourage members all to retrieve and, and give in their homework, we discussed at our last workshop. I have done my homework, but I've given it to marking to Councillor Ross Shaw before I'm allowed to send it in. So um, if you remember, it was making sure we said what our priorities are. There's some questions that Councillor Carlos sent around and reminded us all about early last week. So uh, please, can you get that back? Because it just helps officers in determining what our priorities are. We've got all got, everything's a priority, isn't it? But at the end of the day, we have to make a decision. So, so questions, comments on this paper, Councillor Buckley? This is just a brief uh, point, really, uh, Chair. Um, it mentions here, right at the top of... Uh, uh, whatever page it is, actually, but so this is a different document. Um, but it's um, one, two, three, three bullet points down, um, and it just says that this will be concentrated on uh, or based upon deprivation, uh, population density, and predicted housing growth. Um, and I just wanted to make the point that um, if you take certain wards. Um, some of us have wards which are above average in terms of um, lack of deprivation. But nevertheless, there are islands of deprivation in almost all of these wards, in including mine in particular. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the people who are marooned, if you like, uh, who are deprived but are in better, uh, overall, in better off wards, uh, are not missed out. Uh, and not measured because of that. I think we all recognise, Councillor Buckley, yeah. as well, that deprivation can be all over, can't yeah. it? We all realise that. It's just trying to cater for it all with rising demand and rising levels of poverty. Just, just, just a, the, a sort of technical response to Councillor Buckley's point. Um, the, the, we're using the, um, the sensor super output area level of information, which helps you get, get to that sort of level... Um, so it's not at ward level, it's the, the ne next level down, which hopefully will pick up some of those places that you mentioned. Any more questions on this paper, or can we move on to the next one? Lovely. Um, well, in that case, um, we note progress and look forward to discussing further in the service improvement plan. Can I see all those in favour? Thank you very much, Councillor Bolt. Um, I'm just going to jump a paper because uh, Kevin's got to go and get a train. So, uh, can we just do Mass Transit Vision 24 to staff consultation? Kevin, do you want to introduce this item? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, this paper is just presenting um, some background on the next stage of consultation on the Mass Transit Vision document, um, which we're looking to put out to statutory consultation. And so, the document went to public consultation in 2021. Uh, we had good, positive feedback on that, wide ranging, um, and the document's revised to take account of that. Um, and now what we need to do and want to do is, is promote that through a, a statutory consultation process, going to the statutory consultees, requesting responses back uh, on the revised uh, document. It is equally open to anybody to respond to. We'll make it available uh, online, so we'd seek uh, any responses from the wider public as well and any other interested parties. Uh, but in particular, we'd be writing to the statutory consultees asking for their 
uh, responses on, on the document. Um, it's a 12-week consultation, which would be commencing um, from next week. Um, so it runs through to just beyond uh, Christmas and New Year, goes into the beginning of January. Um, and from that, then, we would take those responses, provide the normal review and feedback on that. Um, so it's just to update the, uh, the, the committee on that um, and to ask for support to progress with that, if that's okay. That's just, and, and how would you involve, how are you going to involve members of this committee in that consultation? Indeed. Um, so the, the, the recommendation actually asks uh, for, for any thoughts on the actual document itself um, and, and equally on the, the, the consultation process uh, that's proposed. Uh, it's a fairly standard uh, approach to that consultation process. Um, but uh, again, throughout the, the course of that 12-week uh, period, we, we can engage further as necessary if there's a, a, a need to do that, absolutely. Okay. Any questions for Kevin whilst he's here? Kevin, Councillor Bolt and Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was looking through, obviously, the, the consultations launch very quickly, and one of the key issues with that would be the route development. People, obviously, engage more when it impacts them. It'd been useful if we could have seen some idea of how the routes were developing using North Kirk Lee's example. At one time, it was uh, alluded to that the Span Valley Greenway might be an MRT corridor. Obviously, people would have a big interest in that because there's housing estates built up at the side of it. And if they saw the, uh, the dynamics change, then that also impacts on air quality, environmental and other things. And similarly, if it went down the A638, those people would serve the route alignments, I think, are going to influence consultation more than just the vagary of do we want uh, MRT. So I think it all has to go in a proper legal order, Councillor Bolt. I think you can't you can only do one thing at once, apparently, with this legal stuff. Yeah, that's correct. Um, uh, th there will be route uh, uh, corridor consultation uh, in due course. We're, we're progressing that um, development work now and, and throughout next year, uh, and that consultation will follow that. But really ahead of that, what we want to do is get the mass transit vision document onto a statutory footing uh, for two purposes, really, um, to, to feed into the local transport plan next year, uh, but equally to give us that firm footing for that route uh, consultation process that, which would follow on. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. It's just a note or a question on the document itself. Um, page 26 for Bradford Northwest Leeds, so not on the consultation, but the document. There's a, um, it's in, well, it co contradicts itself, mm -hmm. mentions both light rail and slash tram being parked, but also being the main option. So if that could be checked, it would be appreciated. Thank I'll you. certainly take that away and, and check that and correct it. Thank you. Top of the class, Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Knowing the detail of the document, that's very impressive. <coughs> Any more questions, comments before we let Kevin go and get his train? No. Um, well, in that case, can um, I just ask that uh, members are happy with the recommendations? I'm happy to propose those. Can I see all those in favour, please show? Thank you very much. That is carried. Kevin, you can go and get your train. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking it out. Thank you. So going back now to item nine, governance updates. I'm hoping we can get through this relatively quickly as well. Dave? Yes, um, th this, um, uh, I think, confirms the um, the arrangements for the uh, the deputy chairs uh, and uh, uh, of the uh, representation on other committees as well um, and just a, a little bit more clarity on the roles and activities of transport engagement leads um, uh, I'm very conscious that um, we had a very useful meeting with transport engagement leads uh, uh, probably six weeks or, or more ago um, and following this uh, committee uh, we'll probably follow up well we will follow up probably later today um, uh, with an email to each of you um, with uh, with a little bit more sort of, sort of suggestion in terms of how uh, how we can go about sort of facilitating the first of the um, um, of the district meetings uh, we've done some work in terms of identifying both combined of of authority officers and district council officers to support those meetings so I'll follow that up with a little bit more detail uh, to you um, this afternoon and then uh, and then hopefully that can help us sort of start putting some planning around having some meetings before the end of the year. And you've engaged with district chairs who, as a result of that? Yes, and, and the way this is playing back to the district chairs, what the um, uh, what, what, what arrangements we're, we're suggesting and and, um, uh, and starting to the discussion around what the where the meetings might be and when they might be. Uh, what, what, a, what a draft agenda looks like and that sort of thing. Councillor Hutchinson? 
Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask whether that email is going to uh, set out what kind of support we might, the local uh, forums might involve? Because obviously there's venues, there's advertising, there's note taking. Uh, it, it, it will. I mean, the resource it, it, yeah. neutral. It, it, it will. I mean, it, it, there's a. The, the intent of these meetings are, are, are relatively are, are less resource heavy than the previous meetings are replaced, um, but it will sort of set out how how we'll go about doing those things and uh, and, and and as a basis of sort of ongoing discussion as to how we firm them up. I think the answer is yes, Councillor yeah. Hutchinson. It will tell us, um, and obviously perhaps if you just email and write to the district chairs first just to make sure they're happy with arrangements for them yeah. to spread more widely. Yes. Yeah. Elsa Bolt. Uh, thanks. Just clarity. Point 2.8 uh, says two local transport forums will be held by council area per year. I think in the original document it said a minimum of two, didn't it? There is obviously a marked difference between it, it, the two. It, it did indeed. <laughs> um, uh, but the air is ticking over, so I think, <coughs> yeah, I think the, the realistically... Um, we uh, we should sort of try and aim to have one um, before the end of the calendar year, obviously before the Christmas period, and and, and something similar uh, around Mar March. Um, but and it, this doesn't preclude, particularly if there are some specific issues. It was uh, it was in the transport committee sort of review that um, intermediate ones could have been arranged um, that uh, that are particularly re relevant if there's some some local issue that needs that uh, is best dealt with in that sort of way. But I think that for this year, um, I think that realistically, two cycles is probably where we are because we'd probably be having them this month if uh, if, if we'd sort of done this from standing start rather than sort of pick it up in the first couple of uh, meetings in terms of finalising the Transport Committee review. So I think we do want to get on with it. I think, Dave, is what we're yeah. saying. Yeah. Can we just amend that then to say a minimum of two because if, it, if we're adopting this document mm. and it says two you could get a transport leader who will say nope you've had it you've added two and i'm not calling you a special one to deal with the reaver uh, if we need one no good point that's about thank you lovely well with that amendment then um are we happy to accept the recommendations as outlined can i see all those in favor please show thank you very much that is carried move on then to active travel um is Liz Hunter on the top of this, or there's maybe somebody else? It's Helen. Helen. <laughs> Helen, would you like to present this? Um, thank you. So what this paper is doing is really just bringing an update on a few things around the active travel agenda. Um, we just really wanted to kind of introduce you to Active Travel England, which um, has been a, a body set up by DFT um, and are starting to kind of take much more of a, a role within active travel and are really looking at um, inspections and scheme design. So there's been quite a bit of, of working with Active Travel England to, to work through a number of funding areas. Um, the, kind of, the latest round of, um, of Active Travel tranche three funding, um, which was looking at the social prescribing um, in Leeds and Bradford, uh, which we were successful for in Leeds and Bradford for 1.3 million, and the Mini Holland um, Feasibility study for 80,000, which we were successful for in Calderdale, have both kind of come through some of that process. Um, we are also um, wait, awaiting for guidance um, around active travel for capital funding, um, which is, um, we, we are, should be, that will be a three year programme for which we will be able to bid for. So um, funding is kind of still outstanding, but Active Travel England and DFT are working on that at the moment. In the meantime, um, we have been able to um, bid into um, the revenue capability and capacity funding, which was up to 1.6 million we were eligible for. Um, that is on the back of a self-assessment, um, which we submitted and submitted to. Um, each district was asked to, asked to submit a self-assessment form and then us as the combined authority. Um, us as the combined authority, they then took the combined authority level um, and we've come out as a level three, which enabled us to... Um, be eligible to bid for 1.6 million, which was submitted um, at the end of um, September. So um, the revenue part is in progress and we're waiting for the capital um, part to be released effectively. Um, the 
the paper also just gives a really quick update on where we are on the active travel strategy, which is bringing together all of these different elements and to basically um, work with um, ATE to move that forward as well. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see that we're able to apply for this money. Let's hope we get it. Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Reading through it, Active Travel England will have quite a significant part in looking at design of, sch of schemes and advising on that and the funding. With the time courses of these capital projects, a there's a lot in the pipeline. Does Active Travel England have any role in reviewing the designs of, of uh, projects that haven't necessarily reached the build stage, but are within the pipeline, or is it purely projects that are coming on from now onwards? Um, so they're, they're trying to do both. So they're trying to come in as early as possible or as early as we want them to come into, into the process to be able to review that design, um, to capture and work with us early for any kind of non-compliance as such schemes. Where are they based, these people? Um, they're based in York, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> they will be, yes. They will be. So, um, But, yeah, they're in the process of being based in York. So they're going to be in Yorkshire, which is a good start. Um, somebody else wants to speak. That's Councillor McLaughlin first. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just looking at uh, Annex A on pages 57 and 58, and they're... Uh, the, the categorisation of schemes. Um, and I was just wondering where the creation of um, greenways might come in under some of these categories, because I'm struggling to fit it into the ones that are there. And uh, things like, the, you know, the resurfacing of canal towpaths, which we've just had half of one in my area, and I'm waiting for the other half to be done. Um, in some parts of, of this county, the creation of greenways, I'm sure Martin will back me up on it, is the most obvious and best way to improve active travel. Um, so I was just hoping that it hadn't been omitted. Um, so I, I can ask the question directly about to, that question directly about to Travel England, but I think th this particular kind of taxonomy, as they called it, um, was to relate to how we um, scored ourselves, if you like, for more kind of on highway on highway routes rather than off highway routes, and that's that's to fit in with essentially the local transport note that this was working towards. Canals of transport, aren't they? Really? I suppose depends how you define transport. It was it was the highway of eighteen hundred, yeah. um, but obviously I suppose it's not seen that perhaps the same way again. Um, somebody else was indicating was it Councillor Hutchinson? I know it's Councillor Bolt. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, I'm sure like many, I welcome the appointment of Active Travel England, but particularly the fact that um, the previous government and Andrew Gilligan in particular held out to ensure it was created as an executive agency uh, under the DFT, so it can't be axed at the whim of future governments, like we saw in the, the bonfire of the Quangos in 2010 when uh, Cycling England was scrapped. I think, nominally it's based in York, but DFT, I believe, have an office in Leeds, because I saw on social media that ATE were um, proudly showing off the door plate outside the Department of Transport, where Active Travel England, because of the um, alphabetical link, is now at the top of all the transport things that come under DFT, which is how it should be. The other good thing about Active Travel England and the issue about their a review process is, is worthy of note and a, a warning to errant councils that Active Travel England, uh, when they do zero rate or downgrade people, can recommend that funding is withheld from schemes until they get their acting gear. But Brian Deegan, their network design lead, is also very proactive. And when we showed him on social media a picture of um, some road signage in Kirklees, which said cyclists dismount on the main road, he immediately re re replied and rebuffed it and said that's the wrong sign for that location. So I welcome this and hope that it will help all our active travel across the piece. And as Matt says, we need to make sure that greenways, because governments of all colour have said for many years that they will protect former rail corridors. We want to see those protected and enhanced and delivered for active travel in the short term and other travel potentially in the longer term. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carlo. Thanks, Chair. I mean, I was going to go um, coming a bit on, on that question because 
one of the points um, coming out of that is I, in fact, met Active Travel, Active Travel England this morning to look at some of our schemes. One of them, I was informed, is one of the best schemes they've seen across the ones they've had submitted at the time. So that's, so that's ex excellent to see that. I didn't see all the schemes, but we'll see. But I think what's really good is, is the way that um, what I've seen today is the meeting district officers on a number of schemes that are quite new for us to be delivering and designing that we need to learn from what's happened in other areas, but also what's happened across Europe on how to develop really good active travel schemes. And unfortunately, we don't have that experience here uh, as, as they've had in areas that have been doing it for many years. And they've been really assisting in doing that training with district officers to um, talk about some of the struggles they face. And actually, it's really good to have that um, that board to talk to that have that experience of all, all the areas uh, across um, uh, that have done that work in Greater Manchester in London, but then, yeah, further afield as well. But um, I'm also I'm very happy, really, that the CA got that level of uh, score that we did on, on level three there, which is for strong leadership and support of active travel, um, but as well on the deliverability of the schemes that we put out. And it's only that that allowed us to apply for some of the funding we have. So I think that's the, the good work that's gone on on a lot of schemes over the last few years that's got us to the point where we're able to do that. The one thing I've noticed in the last couple of days is just how people have been mentioning West Yorkshire uh, uh, on the same level as Manchester recently. And that was something that a few years ago never happened, did it? And we, we were always disappointed in that, that everyone was talking about Greater Manchester. But actually, uh, I've met officials from DFT this, this week. I've met various other people from across uh, the country and they've all come up to Leeds to see what has been happening here under West Yorkshire um, combined authority and that's really got us on the map I think for a number of these schemes where, where we weren't before. Thank you Councillor Carroll. Councillor Smith. Like others around the room I, I would hope Appendix A isn't taken too literally. Um, quite clearly it, it does appear to kind of exclude um, schemes that have got don't have any connection at all with current vehicular highways. It seems to be more a manual as to how, how you would do street improvements in a way that respects uh, active travel. Um, apart from the, the example that's been very clearly mentioned about greenways on former railways or canals and so forth, um, it doesn't seem awfully good in dealing with pedestrian movement through through built-up areas, you know, of actually recognising where there are pedestrian um, desire lines uh, which, um, wh which are in need of improvement or removal of obstacles, that, that, that kind of thing. So, as I say, just generally would prefer that Appendix A wasn't, didn't have to be treated too literally. Uh, my second point was simply, can they think of a better word than taxonomy, please? <laughs> I had to ask what that meant when I first read that, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, what does it mean? <laughs> it just means scheme description. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Right. Ah, it's, just try, it's just trying to pretend they know more than we do, but we, we're getting ahead of this. We know more about this stuff now. As, as Councillor Carroll says, we've got some good schemes going and we obviously want more. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the question on um, you know, the off-road um, the off-road pedestrianisation and uh, canals that go on places, something we've men mentioned before. Uh, Councillor Dugon. Yes, certainly this is, this is very welcome and uh, I am in, in York, I do get comments from people about have you seen what's happening in Leeds recently? Obviously you've got a lot more space than we have to, to play with. But the point, point I was going to make was that um, I'm, I'm certainly, from my experience uh, in looking at our active travel schemes. One of the things that Active Travel England will need to try and address is the actual uh, scale of costs of a scheme that meets the LTN 120 is significantly more. And, and I think that is one of the difficulties that we've had in terms of you know the, the bids we put in at very short notice back in 2020. Um, the scale of... Um, <coughs> what we put in there was nowhere near adequate enough to deliver compliance schemes, which obviously the, the LTM 120 only came in that summer after we put the first bid in. And so we're, we're now in the process of trying to get schemes which are closer to being compliant, but then looking for where the funding is going to come from because we haven't 
bid for sufficient money to deliver those uh, in, in, in full. So, you know, that is going to be, it's not just about quality, it's about the funding that's going to be available centrally to deliver those. In an environment where there's rising costs, which obviously reduces what you can deliver. Uh, Councillor Jones? Yeah, just a point on um, Annex A. Uh, we're talking about walking and cycling, but we need to also remember that people who are walking may be disabled in a wheelchair or blind, and I can't see anything in there that would improve their mobility um, or ease of access. So I'd like that to be looked at, if that would be okay. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Good point. So um, just what you heard there was obviously Annex A is probably caused the most, you know, questions. It's like, you know, what, what do we, is it got to be road? Active travel doesn't always on road, is it? I mean, active travel obviously is like hiking and walking around fields sometimes. So for those schemes like the canal scheme and, uh, you know, how can, can we accommodate that? Can active travel accommodate that? Or is that via another route? And similarly with accessibility, and that's something the combined authorities obviously challenged on a regular basis to say, you know, on, or like on the canal, you know, can wheelchairs get on that canal path? And that is something that we obviously need to be very mindful of. Yeah, and that's something we'll pick up with Active Travel England. That specific taxonomy, if you like, um, was what they wanted us to score our self, do our self-assessments on. Um, that's not to say that, that they're excluding greenways and part of a cycle network but that was their particular scoring criteria but we can certainly pick that up in our discussions so can we just ask them about that then we will in do. terms of yeah. disabled access and off-road yeah. yeah anything else for anybody councillor bolt councillor salam first then councillor bolt yeah uh, thanks very much I, I i think most of us have actually uh, commented on annex a I mean, one of the things that I look in there is that school streets. I mean, there are school streets pop popping up uh, 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 around different different areas. Uh, my only worry is that how are we going to actually patrol those? Because uh, when the, the, the street goes up, there may be a, a, a warden there for a day or two. But then uh, everything just goes back to normal. People are actually just entering those streets and, and, and parking and everywhere, and, and, and there is no... Uh, mechanism of closure um, and also when we are actually designing those that we've got to also look at the, uh, the the locality I mean give you an example I mean one of the school streets that have gone up in my area uh, where there's a mosque and a school next to each other but if you were to close that street from the entrance of where, where, where people enter then you would close the access to the mosque and if there is a funeral there'll be hell on to be honest with you, and I've asked for that to be actually moved down um, past the entrance of, of where they actually take the hearse in or, or the bodies in. So when we are actually designing those, we, we, we've also got to look at that. And the other thing I just wanted some clarity on is that is, is the um, on page 58, the top one, bus priority measures at single location is the bus gates. Now, we are talking, you know, colleague said about wheelchairs and and, and it's not just about wheelchairs, it's where disabled people have uh, uh, bikes which they can actually you know, uh, pedal with their hands and they are like three wheelers. And we've got some of those at Capital Cycling where we encourage disabled people to come and try them out in, 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 uh, in the uh, Capital of Cycling which is uh, uh, inside. Um, I mean, the bus gate just down the road here does actually close doesn't it closes the road off for, for for cars, but the buses are still going backward and forward in that. And we learned from the experience from London, where m many of the cyclists were actually killed uh, in, in the bus lanes because they had shared uh, uh, bus lane and, and and cycling groups. Uh, I mean, how is this gonna be developed? Is it like the Armley, you know? improvement of bus gates and then cycle lane separated from it or, or are we saying people can actually go into the bus gates where buses are actually moving all over the place thank you so this comes down to the design process and kind of how we build that through and that's where active travel england want to get more involved to basically understand what we're prioritizing how we're prioritizing and therefore um 
what how best is the design to kind of suit that process but that's an exactly an example of the type of thing that we need to work with them on to try and make sure we're there's no compromises for anybody in in any of that okay work in progress i think council yeah uh, council bolt yeah thanks Jade. picking up on what colleagues have said could i suggest uh, an addition to the recommendations that we invite active travel england to come and meet the transport committee at some point i think yeah we've all had questions it'd be good to meet uh, one or two people and just a point of information for uh, councillor carlo when you're talking about um having experience in developing active travel schemes one forward thinking authority in west yorkshire in 2007 won the european greenways award sadly our colleagues haven't kept it up since but i've got a facsimile of that certificate at home so um i very welcome to always welcome to have uh, people with new organizations and money uh to come and meet with us um uh, so yes, by all means, let's add that in as a recommendation for them to come and, and even it's a workshop actually, it doesn't have to be a transport committee meeting, we have development sessions, so it's probably more appropriate development session. Okay, anybody else, are we okay to look at the recommendations? I'm happy to propose those, can I see all those in favour, please show. Thank you, that is carried. And we do actually have an active travel working group, don't we? So perhaps, um, and we're all invited to that, so perhaps could we invite ATA to come to that? Thank you. Lovely. Next item on the agenda is the Mayor's West Yorkshire Local Transport Plan. We have a lot of plans, but we need a new one because government tell us we need a new one. Um, so, um, Helen, do you want to... Thank you. Um, so what this report is setting out really is the work um, that we're starting to, to go through on the new um, Local Transport Plan for West Yorkshire. Um, the reason there's two reasons behind this but um the first one is that dft are requiring all local transport authorities to have a new local transport plan in place by march 24. this is to enable us to access funding um capital funding from 25 26. um so um dft is setting out those time scales albeit we haven't received the guidance yet from dft but um, we are assured that that is coming in the next month or so um, the guidance is likely to focus on um, strong, much stronger views on decarbonisation and quantified carbon. Um, so these are the two kind of new and different areas that we'll really need to pick through um, in the local transport plan. We, um, we are in the process of having discussions um, with each district and kind of working through what that might look like with each district. And one of the recommendations in here is we come back with a, um, a workshop basically um, with transport committee to try and help shape some of the content. Some of the content in there um, but we um, basically we want to kind of bring some kind of policy discussions through that to enable us to discussion and to get a, trans a local transport plan that is suitable across the whole of West Yorkshire. Councillor Hutchinson do you want to come up? Thank you Chair. Um, yes I mean I wel welcome this refresh because the latest local transport plan that we have is 2017 and it's extremely weak on dealing with climate change um, it really doesn't feature at all um, so and we know and I hope everyone around this table knows that the carbon dioxide that's being emitted now is going to be around for 300 odd years you can't go and ex try and execute a screeching emergency stop in 2050 and expect everything to be all right because it won't be um, so I would like reassurance that we are working in developing this plan in conjunction with the climate energy and environment committee who at their meeting earlier on this week were um, describing their methodology for quantifying the carbon emission and the carbon budgets for projects so that can be considered in addition to the shaving of seconds off journey times and the and the and the, and the costs of uh, projects that come under our consideration. I think Rod Steve can deliver it quicker really in terms of transport plans. Is, is that the timeline or can it be speeded up? So yeah, so that's exactly some of the things we're looking at. And the methodology that was put through the Climate and Environment Committee earlier in the week. So we, um, we, we don't know yet what the guidance is going to say around some of that, but um, we would hope to kind of apply similar approaches to what we're, what we're doing here.
So on, so on the timescale front, so we are um, basically the, the transport plan will have will have a timescale applied to it, and it's about how we can work towards net zero to 2038. Um, but so that's part of our discussions around what time do we want to have delivered some of the policy interventions in there, and that's part of the conversation we want to have through um, through our discussions over the next couple of months. So this is the beginning; it's not the end of a discussion. Obviously, this is yeah. presumably we'll be assigning this. Um, transport plan off, ready to go to combined authority to, to sign off that. Yeah, exactly. So we'd look to then go out to um, a statutory consultation at some point in the early in the new year. Quite a lot of work to do in the next few months. Any more questions on this? Councillor Bolt. Uh, just a comment, and uh, just for uh, putting the public and things, should we at this point know that uh, we've received the, can we receive the letter from Mr Ray and we'll take it into account during future considerations? Absolutely. Any more questions or comments? Sorry, Chair, just briefly. Uh, on page 61 to 10, uh, uh, bullet point three, improve more inclusive customer service and support so passengers have the tools to travel with confidence and help that they need if to plan their journeys, but also the, the confidence of actually traveling safely and there is a campaign going around now uh, which is get me home safely um, and i think also in the manifesto of the of, of the mayor was to actually protect uh, young girls and, uh, and women on, on on public transport and i think this campaign the get me home safely also actually targets more of a, the, the hospitality and, and and the servicing industry, uh, sectors where people are actually you know going home uh, when the last bus is already gone uh, or they're all uh, and also uh, any vulnerable or, or people or, or people in need of help um, in this in this town centers and I think some operators are actually uh, joining the campaign but I think we should encourage also through this the you know uh, item is that the other operators if there is anybody that needs help or, or are in distress now the operators should allow people to travel on their buses uh, free of charge i know that the, it's already in rule that if if somebody is, is is stranded or needs to travel on the last bus and they haven't got any money that they can do but this would be beyond that that if somebody was to travel at nine o'clock at night for argument's sake in, in winter months uh, that they should be actually you know uh, 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 getting on to this well, so, and that's a, obviously a bus comment but I think um, from a wider transport plan point of view it's it's also about taxes isn't it because yes. obviously as we discussed earlier today you might be looking in Wakefield to get a bus at nine o'clock at night that's that's a real issue isn't it um, so it's about all transport modes being safe, isn't it, really? And I think that's a, that's a very good point. And it is included, obviously, it says inclusive. Presumably that implies... So, yeah, so what you're picking up on there is some of the um, kind of the interventions across the five key areas noted in the bus service improvement plan. And what the local transport plan will do is sit above, essentially, all of these daughter documents, if you like. So the bus service improvement plan is one of those, along with a whole raft of others um, that will set out in a bit more detail what we mass transit vision is another set out you know what we mean by what we want to do in those in all of those different areas mm. so but your example around safety for example would be core to our local transport plan and our approach across all across all modes yeah good point any more questions comments on this paper no are we happy to rec and um, to accept recommendations as they're outlined there in um, 10 Yes, can I see all those in favour please show? Thank you very much, that is carried. <coughs> Moving then on to item 13, transport policy update. Helen, is this you? Oh, you, it's out of date, is this? Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Empty yeah. Carry on. So I'll pick up a couple of things. So obviously this, this paper was put together um, a little while ago that brings up a couple of bits in here, so I'll just jump through to some of the main ones. But we it was prepared for the September meeting that then didn't happen and then we've updated it but kept some of the detail in from before um, so I think just the most recent updates in here um, around kind of just updates around transport for the north and the fact that um, they, they met in June and then they met again at the end of September 
um, particularly to speak around um, the social inclusive transport strategy and their strategic transport plan and um, and then also updates around the integrated rail plan and trans Pennine route upgrade um, things of which we've spoken about previously within this meeting um, also within that time it's noted in here that rail north was meant to meet and obviously then didn't um, due to events in September so that didn't happen and then um, also in here, um, it's just really given an update on the Transport Select Committee report around the um, integrated rail plan um, through that process. Um, we've also just used this document to just again give an update around the Trans Pan route upgrade that we spoke about, um, spoke through um, earlier in the meeting um, and providing that wider update. And then moving on to other things away from rail, we've used it as an opportunity to just give an update on the electric vehicle infrastructure strategy, which Again, it's a statutory document that we are um, required to write, um, write for government to be able to deliver infrastructure around electric vehicles. And just to note in there that we were unsuccessful um, with the bid around the electric vehicle infrastructure pilot, um, which was um, announced earlier, um, a couple of months ago now. Um, and yes, they are, that's the main updates I think in there. So very disappointed about that EV pilot thing. I mean, it was only ten million pounds nationally, wasn't it? So it was peanuts, but not even to get peanuts is is pretty disappointing. I mean, um, it is such a huge growth sector in the future. What are we doing about it as a nation? We can't do it on our own, can we? That is, you know, we we club together as West Yorkshire to make sure we we work and get a bus network that works for everybody. But we can't just do an EV infrastructure. Uh, just from West Yorkshire, it needs to be a national intervention. I just don't see that happening at the moment. I, I had some people indicating then, is that Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor Thompson, was it? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, the first thing I was going to raise was the was the electric vehicle charging point bid. I'm just wondering why our bid was unsuccessful, presumably because there were just too many and most of them were going to be. Um, but secondly, on uh, the levelling up from the LUF on page 73, um, how, how, to the best of your knowledge, which is an important caveat in this question. How committed is the current government to the levelling up fund money? Um, and is it, is it likely to be one of the things that disappears? Because the noises I'm hearing are not encouraging. Um, can I just answer the first one of those? Because you'll see in item 2.28 uh, that the ones that were successful were Barnet, Dorset, Durham, Kent, Midlands Connect, North Yorkshire, Nottingham, Sunshire, Suffolk and Warrington. None of them are urban areas. And I think um, whether that's political, whether that's urban, rural, there's a deficit in rural and urban, we can all make our own conclusions about that. But um, so I'm not sure how if comprehensive feedback has been received. Um, not comprehensive feedback, but we, they said they really liked our bid, um, but they've had a lot of bids across the country um, and um, basically yeah, chose some areas to prioritise that they had a bit more certainty around um, partner arrangements, I think, um, for delivery. Thanks. Um, just a, a, a request for information around um, that funding bid and just how we proposed to accelerate off-street um, electric vehicle parking, because it's something that um, I think in Leeds, for example, will be uh, one idea of kind of converting the lamppost to allow them to allow people to charge their car off them wouldn't work because Leeds has the wrong kind of lamppost. So I'm quite concerned about that. That's just something I've heard. I'm not sure if that's definitely true, but um, I'm just quite concerned about what the actual options are for um, off-street electric vehicle parking. Um, and uh, <clears throat> obviously, we've got lots of streets where most of the streets probably um, in where I live in that part of Leeds don't have off-street um, electric vehicle parking. So. What do those options look like for it? Uh, Salam, you've got your microphone on, by the way. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's also very expensive, isn't it, using lampposts, is, is my understanding. Uh, but I suppose tied with that, we, what are the next steps? Because we can't just say, take that, can we? We've got to keep developing it. Yeah, so, so our next steps is to write the electric vehicle infrastructure strategy document, which, as I say, we are required to do so by government to receive funding going forward. Um, within that, um, and part of our bid was essentially to test different business models and different ways to do charging, um, particularly on street charging where you've got areas of, you know, terraced houses or different uh, or other constraints. 
um, we in that particular instance we were looking at um, car parking and grouping options and things like that but that's obviously not workable across all of the areas so our, 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 we're hoping our strategy will be able to help deliver and develop a few other different ideas in that world <coughs> which is why we were seeking the funding to help help that come forward there's also pressure on leveling up but that may not be something that officers can answer um, we also mentioned in the recommendation about rail station accessibility, which we've not discussed. Uh, was there anything you wanted to say particularly on that? Sorry, yeah, I didn't, yeah, we just brought that up. That was basically, that's just setting out where we are on waiting for funding for access for all around rail station accessibility. Okay, Councillor Jones. On that note, um, I would appreciate an update on the accessibility of Mink Hill Station. Having a disability myself, I'm going to have to hold myself up those steps this evening. So um, I was aware that it was supposed to start last year, and I'm just wondering if I could privately have a, an update on that. Thank you. Let's have an update on that station, please. Yeah, and we can have a conversation. That's absolutely fine. Lovely. With those questions, then, can I ask uh, if you're happy with the recommendations outlined there? All in favour, please show. Thank you very much. That is carried. So, next we go. Are we on passenger experience yet? Passenger experience update report. We've touched on this. We've touched on quite a few of the issues here, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll take questions. This is a report we, um, we, we sort of bind uh, all that sort of information about how the sort of transport network's working at the moment and, and, uh, and issues within it. So, uh, a number of graphs and, and other pieces of information, so I'll take any questions that members have. Um, but it's there as an update. I mean, um, the bus um, performance might not be very comprehensive in the report, but I'm sure all of us from speaking to constituents know that there is a significant amount of dissatisfaction out there uh, because of unreliability mainly of the service, really. Uh, and um, obviously, all this stuff around driver shortage and what we're doing about that and how we're supporting operators to resolve that is, is very important but there's there's wider issues out there really as well is anybody got any questions or comments on this paper in particular councillor mclaughlin uh, thank you chair yeah a, a couple of things mainly because it's pertinent to my area but about um the appalling record of Transpain and express mm -hmm. um that's detailed on pages 96 and 97 something like was it uh, 21% of services were cancelled. That's not even including the ones that were cancelled the night before. Um, it's not acceptable that a, a company that is making profit can, can operate this poorly. I just wanted a, a general update about what we and they are doing to try and address the problem and how successful those efforts are being. But more specifically, I think something may have been missed or overlooked or omitted from um, Appendix 2 regarding the, the new train timetables. Uh, particularly from Manchester to Huddersfield by Staley Bridge. Um, a 90-minute gap has appeared in the evenings on weekdays. Um, the, from the, the 8.58 from Piccadilly, and then nothing along all those stations along that route until half past 10 from the half past 10 from Victoria. That's the first time there's been that, a 90-minute gap at these stations since 2008, potentially 2000, but we can't get the records for that far back. But the, the local memory is that that's the case. Um, so I was wondering if, if Transpain had offered an excuse for this and, and whether we were working to try and address this gap in the provision. I, I will have to come back to you on the evening thing. I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but um, but we'll have a, a close look at it. I think in, in generality, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's accepting that, that, that um, Transpain and uh, performs very very poor. The uh, the mayor has uh, met with the managing director, um, seek assurances. As I think uh, most members are probably aware, they, there's some industrial relations issues that are sitting at the back of this, as well as some some um, some driver shortage and training issues. Um, we often actually have somebody from TPE here at this meeting. We we don't today, um, uh, and uh, I think quite a lot of pressure has been put on them by the rail industry as well as by uh, by the mayor and, and council Hinchcliffe and others to to um, to get their act together, um, but um, I think that's where it stands at the moment. Um, but they haven't told me in terms of the, um, the the passenger experiences that people are having at the moment. 
But can we ask them to come to the next meeting then? In that case? Yes, that's fine. I, I'll I'll go back to uh, to that. I, that's the usual stakeholder um, manager and, and ask for for her attendance at least. Thank you. Any more questions, comments, Councillor Thompson? Thank you, Chair. Um, just wondering if there are ways that where we have cluster user groups, for example, we can create or use existing conduits for their experiences to be understood and heard um, by whatever means works best. Thank you. I mean, that's a, that's something perhaps the bus, bus engagement leads can do um, for each do through, through that, yes. And, and, um, uh, and we, we will be reporting to you the um, the outcome of the res big bus chat which is you know, quite extensive engagement with uh, with people on on satisfaction bus services but yes local user groups feeding in local issues i think is is, is quite helpful can you make sure that the insurers that go out accommodate that yes and, and to encourage them to to participate in the, the local forum because that you know that's what that's there for so um we need those sort of people particularly representing passengers um to to be uh, to be part of that uh, and one of the things we uh, we would um more than just actively encourage we'd probably sort of make it quite strong that they do is that those meetings are attended by operators who, who will now slot on the, on the agenda as they did with the district consultation committee meeting to actually <coughs> explain themselves uh, at, at a local level in terms of the, um, the issues that, uh, that, that they're dealing with, but also to listen to what people are saying. Thank you. And it says about obviously Northern uh, are going to restore their timetable for December 22 from December 21, but just says with a few, almost all cases. What's that, almost all cases? Uh, no. Replicates the timetable that was there before. I think it's okay. probably, we could uh, do with looking at that then, Dave, because yeah, actually that was, that was a commitment. Yes. So I just want to make sure what that means. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Smith? I uh, totally agree with what's just been said. I mean, I think they're using Decem the December 21 timetable as the base, yeah, yeah. which itself, of course, I I incorporates, an, uh, you know, a, a number of retrograde. So let's just get some clarification on that. This was meant to be December 22 is meant to replicate December 21. Yeah. We all know that December 21 is not as good as we used to have pre-pandemic. Uh, then the battle is obviously with government to make sure that they continue yeah. to fund the service to adequate level so we continue that level of service. Exactly. But that's a fight for another day. The, um, I would expect that the timetables will start, the actual timetables start appearing so that that sort of matching of the journey thing can, can go ahead. Okay. Um, obviously, we're asked to um, just note the updates in the report. Everybody happy with that? Can see all those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. That is carried. Unless uh, I think we've done everything, I'm not missing anything off the agenda. I don't think. Nope. Can I say thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance at this meeting this afternoon, and do have a good weekend. Thank you.